This episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is brought to you by OWC, Spectra 1964, Atom Audio, Sampley, Isotope, and API. You're hearing my voice right now on the API 3122V Mic Pre and Spectra 1964 C610 Comp Limiter through Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron, all recorded safely onto an OWC SSD and mixed on Atom Audio monitors. So get ready to rock. I'm also seeing artists where if you hold a certain level of the of NFT, every quarter, every year, whenever there's new merch, you automatically get that merch and you don't have to burn the NFT. So you still have the NFT and you can keep redeeming it over and over. It's one of those things where there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach it. I think ultimately there's not gonna be a right or wrong way to approach that side of physical NFTs. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. When your band hits the studio, it's smart to have all the songs, mixes, and notes in one place. But figuring out how to share all the files can be frustrating. There's always somebody in the band who can't seem to log in or wants to use a different platform. Sampley.app makes it easy to collaborate and communicate by creating a shared project so the whole band can get organized before the session. Just upload a voice memo, lyric sheet, song charts, photo, video, mixes, masters, or even invoices and start commenting. Sign up for your free account now with 25 gigs of storage and unlimited projects and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade at sampley.app. The Spectra 1964 C610 Comp Limiter brings fast, clean, quiet compression and limiting to your recordings and mixes. The C610 includes the famous Spectra 101 amplifier used in legendary studios like Stax, Ardent, and Record Plant. I love my C610s for drums, vocals, guitars, and especially bass, which helps me get the perfect low end in my mixes. And you can make your mixes rock at spectra1964.com. Howdy, Rockstars. It's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Ethan X. Howard, a producer, engineer, and consultant based in Nashville, Tennessee. Ethan got his start in West Virginia, picking up recording out of necessity to record drums with local punk bands that he played with while still in high school. And after briefly studying music performance at Marshall University, which I believe that's in Huntington, West Virginia, isn't it? Yes, yeah, Huntington. I've been there. I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. Ethan packed up and headed to Full Sail University to get serious about recording. Upon graduating, he had the opportunity to relocate to Nashville for an internship at Blackbird Studios. And in the years since, he's worked as a freelance producer and engineer for developing artists, has helped manage and start several small studios, and has worked as an assistant engineer on sessions for independent and major label artists. A lifetime technology enthusiast, Ethan is currently working working as a consultant focusing on NFTs and Web3 and their applications within the music industry. Very cool stuff. I am psyched to have Ethan on today to talk about both making records in the studio and how the future of NFTs and Web3 can help artists and producers like ourselves and like you, rock stars, survive on a long road towards a successful career in music. What do these things in the future of tech have to do with you know what's going to happen next for us and how important is it? So please welcome Ethan X. Howard to Recording Studio Rockstars. Ethan, are you ready to rock, my friend? Let's rock. Dude, glad to have you here, man. And I think we were uh we were going back and trying to remember how we connected and and you were saying we had just we just kind of chatted in some circles at industry events and stuff like that. I probably like Summer Nam. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Super excited to be here. Yeah, I I think it was uh the Nam week of in 2018, uh Summer Nam here in Nashville. Uh, I think some of our mutual friends connected us and We've run into each other at a few things like that. I, I think uh, 
I believe we were both at the uh, Sterling Sound grand opening here. Oh, yeah, that's right. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. So I'm, much fun. I'm excited for that stuff to come back. By the time this comes out, hopefully we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll already be ready for a break from all the parties and events. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, oh, yeah. you know, like um, all, Summer Nam, when it was happening in Nashville, uh, it's so much fun. It's just, you know, uh, I don't know if you've ever been out to Anaheim for that Nam as well. But like all the, all the events, AES, um, just all the gatherings and all the reasons we get together as a community is really, really fun stuff. Oh, yeah. I've always told people, you know, sometimes as much as I love being in the studio making records, sometimes Summer Nam Week is my favorite week to be in Nashville because everybody's in town from all over. There's all the studio parties that are always a blast. And you get to see people that, you know, normally we're all hold away in our own studios working. And so that week we get to all see each other and hang out at each other's stu- uh, studios. Yeah, exactly. So um, tell us a little bit about your studio. Where are you, um, where do you sort of camp out and make most of your records right now? Uh, right now, I've been kind of floating around a little bit. Um, I've been doing some freelance work, uh, done a good bit of work over at Omni Sound uh, down in Midtown oh, in yeah. Nashville. And, uh, and I've been doing a lot of my assisting work over at the Dog House. Uh, over in West Nashville, Neil Capolino's place. Oh, Neil's great. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Cool. Right on. Yeah. All right. Well, let me see. Um, one thing I was going to mention, I was I was asking you about Huntington, West Virginia. So that's yeah. kind of on my roadmap because when my band, Enormous Richard, was on tour, one of our most epic gigs and all-night parties and that I ever had and and will remember for the rest of my life was at a place called Gumby's in Huntington, Gumby. West Virginia, which is long since gone. But, you know, that is, um, I think that that was there because of Marshall University where you went to school. Mm-hmm. And um, it's like this remarkable little, uh, you know, focal point of cool music and cool artistic expression, I think. Oh, yeah. It, it's always been fascinating. You know, I, I grew up in West Virginia, um, originally grew up in the bottom part of the state around Bluefield and Princeton. Uh, so about two, two, two and a half hours away from Huntington. And then I went to college in Huntington and actually uh, had my first run at at opening a studio in Huntington. I uh, had a really cool, cool. spot downtown, um, was previously occupied uh, by a guy who had done some work way back in the day for Chaka Khan and a couple other artists like that. Wow. And was doing some sync work. And he was just, uh, I don't know what his story was. I didn't get to spend much time with him, but he had it, you know, set up with the, the, control room with the the window going into the two booths and everything was already wired. All I had to do was move in my equipment and, and get rolling. That's so pretty that cool. Was, that was pretty cool. It was unfortunately at the time, you know, West Virginia has an incredible music scene. There's no shortage of incredible players, but a lot of the business infrastructure, at least at the time, just wasn't really in place. So there were a lot of bands, but there weren't many bands with budget. And I mean, that's kind of the case everywhere, but especially a smaller market like that. So it, it, I had commercial real estate downtown Huntington. So it only lasted six or eight months. Um, did get a couple of pretty cool records made there. Uh, but that area is fantastic. I mean, Tyler Childers comes from that area. Oh yeah. Uh, Tyler's great. Around what the a same, voice. Oh my God. Around the same time that I had that studio was when Tyler was first starting to put his act together and he was playing the open mic nights there at, uh, I can't remember, Baja something. It's the, the little burrito place uh, right across from the music building at Marshall on uh, Third Avenue. Oh, cool. Right on. Yeah. So it was around, all right around that same time, you know, they were getting that going and I was doing that before I hopped back down to Nashville. Well, you guys, I mean, up in that area, you know, you just, you just um, sort of like look out the window and they just keep pour, pouring out of the mm-hmm. hills with instruments in their hands, right? <laughs> oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And that, and that's something too. There's a, a great long tradition of mountain music that yeah. you know, uh, incredible stuff that people have never heard of because it's just you know, to, in a lot of mountain culture, music isn't a commercial product. It's just what you do when everybody gets together. It's how people come together and tell stories. There's a lot of you know, a lot of the old time tradition and folklore gets passed down through some of those songs and some of the old fiddle tunes, and and so there's that really cool aspect of it as well, coming from the area that gives you a a much more, a much different appreciation for music than just coming at it from a straight, like commercial viewpoint. Yeah. Big time. I mean, you, you, I love old time music and all the traditional music that happens, but what's remarkable to me too, is the cross section of 
you know, the, you know, you, as you described punk rock. So for example, when we were there, um, on one of our stays through, I think it was the one I, that I'm remembering, um, w- the, the artist that we were opening for was, um, Hazel Atkins, who was this famous dude who would like come out of the, you know, he was like the, the owner of the club had to like drive up and go collect him, um, <laughs> at his, his trailer up in the mountains because, you know, like this guy wasn't living on a calendar, you know? So if it was gig night, mm-hmm. he just had to go get him, you know? And he was like, wait for him to come in from, from, uh, you know, hunting or something like that. Right. And then brought him down. And this guy's singing songs about like chopping your head off on a date and st- just bizarre stuff, oh, yeah. you know? And he plays yeah. guitar and he has a drum kit in full of him and he like in front of him. So he's thumping on the, the kick drum and then when a Phil comes in, he just takes his hands and just beats the drums with his hands and then goes back to the guitar. It's just like total mayhem. <laughs> that's great. I love it. Yeah. And and that's the other thing too, is there's a lot of ingenuity. Uh, and, you know, if you're up in the mountains and you don't have a, a, a drummer, you just, you know, I've even seen people uh, do the old, uh, get like one of those old 1960s hard shell suitcases and put like a mm-hmm. kick pedal on it and yeah. don't, don't have a drummer, don't have a drum. You got a suitcase. Cool. Uh, same thing with spoons. I mean, that's kind of a, a staple yeah. of a lot of that old timey mountain music. I, once upon a time, I was pretty good with a set of spoons. Nice, dude. I, I, I tried to sitting learn some around, spoons. Sitting around clacking away, just, you know, giving a beat. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't just Soundgarden rock stars. Spoons right. were around before that. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Cool, I, man. Well, give us a little bit more background and, you know, how you, how'd you get from being interested in that to, you know, where you are now and tell us some of the stuff that you're involved in at the moment. You know, you've got your studio set up. Obviously, the past couple of years, you may have been moving around a lot too, um, like many people might have, just, you know, as far as figuring out where you're going to record and stuff. But right. um, you're also involved in some really cool new technology and we want to hear about that stuff as well. Yeah, definitely. So I, my entire life, you know, ever since I was a kid, my my dad's a career computer IT guy. Uh, he actually went to Virginia Tech for computer science in the 1970s. So he still somewhere has his uh, box of back when you ran a, a program on a computer by feeding in ticker tape punch right cards on. into the machine. He's still got his, his box of punch cards somewhere. So I, I've been around computers and technology my entire life, which is a lot of what led to when I was playing in those punk bands uh, in Bluefield and Princeton when I was in high school. This was probably mid-2000s. I graduated in 06, so kind of that 02, 03 through 07 was when I was active there. Oh, shit. We, yeah. So we were, <laughs> it was right when things were starting to really change. Um, uh, it's kind of interesting too. There, there's some interesting tie-ins with uh, some of the technology landscape at the time in terms of music and things like Napster and software piracy, which, you know, I don't condone it. If you make money off of it, pay for it. But I think a lot of us, especially in my generation, if it wasn't for, you know, cracks of software floating around. Some of us never would have had the chance to, to try it out and learn. Yeah. Um, so that was a lot of, you know, I was playing in bands. I was always the guy in the bands that had the computers, had some mixers, you know, nothing fancy, but enough to get the job done. And since I had the computers, when it came time to start cutting demos to start booking shows and selling CDs at shows, it was like, well, Ethan's got the computers. He's got a mixer. He figured out how to hook it all up. So we're recording at Ethan's house. Yeah. And that was how I got my start in recording and uh, just kind of got the bug, had a little bit of a natural knack for it and uh, just leaned in real hard. Um, Ended up, like I said, uh, studied string based performance actually at uh, at Marshall for I got about two years done and then kind of realized, well, do I really want to stay on this track? You know, it was a great education, but it's like this is setting me up to be a an orchestral bass player. And that's not really right what I wanted to do with my life. Um, so I pivoted, ended up moving down to Florida, did the recording arts degree at Full Sail, which was fantastic. And uh, and then to, getting towards the end of uh, Full Sail, I was sitting down with uh, my career dev represent- career development representative. And she said, hey, you ought to think about, about Nashville. Here's a couple of studios that we've got relationships with. And from that, the way it ended up working out, I got the internship at Blackbird within a week of graduating full sale. I was going in for my first shift at Blackbird and did that for about six months and hopped around a little more and, uh, and ended up landing back in Nashville permanently. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
guess 2015. And I, I floated around and, you know, worked at a couple of studios, mostly been freelance. Uh, and it's been kind of interesting. One of the reasons that I moved back to Nashville this last time was because I didn't want to necessarily have a, I know this is a topic pretty close to you. I didn't want to, you know, have to have my own home studio. And Nashville at the time was one of the last places where there were still really a really good scene of commercial studios right. where you don't, you don't have to have your own room and you can still book out the room and work. And of course now, <laughs> you know, uh, what, six, seven years later, it's kind of getting a little bit more back to people are working more out of home spaces. And some of these home studios that are popping up more and more are incredibly, it, once you're inside of them, you'd never know that you weren't in a, a major commercial space. Yeah. True. And, they're just, and they're just buildings behind somebody's house or a suite in somebody's basement. Yeah. And why not? You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, if you can make a record at home and it, and it works great. Awesome. I mean, right. there's always, I, I don't, I, well, I can't, I shouldn't use the word always, but there still is. And I imagine there still will be for a while, the difference between a commercial space that is big and bustling versus a home studio. Um, and it's always going to have to do with just the nature of where things are. And if, you know, if you can right. have people coming and going and all that, and 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 um, you know, in a home studio like mine here, it's important to basically just feel like a home. Don't feel like there's something else going on there. And as long as that's the case, then everybody's happy, you know. Right. Well, and that's and another consideration too that you know can't be taken lightly is the economic situation of owning and running a studio. I don't think it's any big secret that the economics of running a commercial studio are not fantastic. Yeah, they're not really in favor of, yeah. of those of us <laughs> who want to run the studio, are they? Yeah, a big analogy uh, I came up with a couple of years ago, I was working on a big studio restoration project uh, and the person who owned the studio is really big into boating. And it he helped me kind of make the connection of like, oh, owning a studio is kind of like owning a boat. You don't necessarily do it because you expect to make money off of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, then some might say that about the music business in general. <laughs> yeah, but, and and certainly you can obviously make make good money if yeah. uh, if everything's set up right. But especially with the you know an old school style, you know, large format console, locker full of vintage mics, all the outboard, something's always breaking. You're always having to replace tubes in something, get something recapped. So it, it certainly can seem like a money sink, but uh, if you do it right, it's it's well worth it. And I, and I think it's one of those things to me too it's not so much always about the equipment as it is the environment. Yeah, totally. And, and so like I, oh, sorry, go well, on. Well, I was just going to add to that and say that while it might seem on the surface like a financial, um, you know, hurdle or challenge to running a, a commercial studio, it's also in, in a context of what you said about the environment, it's also the community. So like in some places like Nashville, when there's enough of a community around it, then you have access to a larger group of people for all these bits and pieces you need. Like, you know, if you need to get a tube amp repaired, you could, you could try to do it yourself, but you may need to have somebody nearby that can do that for you or a microphone repaired, or if you need wiring done, you know, there's all these aspects that surround um, a studio environment as far as keeping it going. Right. And also from a creative standpoint, something that I spent a lot of my more formative years studying was all the different camps throughout history that have been like the big hit factories. Yeah. Uh, like Stax, Motown, Muscle Shoals, Max Martin, Dr. Luke. And one of the big common threads that you see across all of those is it's a camp. It's a team of people. It's not, you know, a producer and his assistant in a home studio, which, you know, certainly in some cases, especially more so now, you see a lot of success that way. But historically, it was multi-room facilities where you've got multiple artists, multiple production teams, songwriters, players, everybody there working together every day. And it's from, you know, seeing somebody in the, you know, in the kitchen in between sessions and you're both on different things. And the conversation that may happen there while you're both getting coffee could be what spurs, you know, an idea that gives you your next hit song. Kind of like the, uh, there's that story about when they were building the Pixar offices, they made one centralized bathroom location so that everybody from the C-suite down to the lowest level animators all had to interact with each other because nice. that, that kind of, that sense of collaboration that you get, that, that's one of my favorite things about working in those, those kinds of facilities. Yeah. That's a cool topic. And then, you know, when you mentioned like 
there are some success stories of the lone producer or something in the studio. You know, of course, the first thing that pops to mind is the kind of uh, Billie Eilish and Phineas story. But honestly, right. when you look closely at that stuff, you're like, well, there's actually a lot of people involved in that. Right. Picture. There's still a big team. Yeah. Still even if it team, was, even if, you don't even see if it. the core, if the core work is done in a bedroom, there's still a team that's yeah. helping with editing and production coordination. And- yeah. If you're ready to upgrade your studio to the famous sound of API's large format consoles, then you're ready for the Box, a small format console featuring the same analog circuitry and original 2520 op amp design that made API famous for more than 50 years. Record through eight world-class mic pre channels, mix through 24 smooth as glass faders, and upgrade your home studio to legendary status. API now offers a virtual console experience allowing you to get a personalized online demo of the box at apiaudio.com. Adam Audio introduces the all-new A7V monitor with rotatable HPS waveguide for the accelerated ribbon tweeter and advanced onboard DSP-based room correction using the included A-Control software or optional Sonarworks software and measurement mic, allowing you to tune your speakers for your room, your mix position, and your ears anytime you want. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve as your studio improves at adamaudio.com. You've got your studio set up now. Uh, how would you talk about, you know, the, the kind of music that really gets you excited? Um, and uh, what's, you know, what's one of your favorite things about making records? Um, again, one of my favorite things about making records is just watching, being there and, and watching and having a role in helping create that environment for artists to really perform their best. And I've been very fortunate over the years. I've gotten to learn from some of the best of the best producers and engineers. Um, back when I was an intern um, years ago, uh, I got to follow around guys like Vance Powell and Nico Bolas. Uh, and over the years, getting to learn from like Neil Capolino, getting to work with him a little bit. Uh, it's just been incredible. Some of the things I've gotten to learn from them and being able to see you know, walk in, you know, the night before when you're doing the setup and it's just an empty room and then you set up all the microphones and then the next day or two days later, by the end of the session, you've got a fully formed album that you, that everybody there basically just conjures up out of thin air. Yeah. There's just, there's just a magic to that, that, you know, that, that feeling of having that finished record or near finished record at the end of a session when you walked in with nothing but an idea and maybe a, a chart on a piece of paper. Yeah, it's I love that. I nothing, call that, nothing um, beats that. I call that building the machine. So like yeah. setting up for a tracking session and getting everything dialed in so that you're in that sweet spot of making music and recording it. It's like oh, this absolutely. big machine you have to build with all the people and all the mics and instruments and everything. Absolutely. And and I've been very fortunate to work across a bunch of different genres. Like growing up, I always listened to if it was good music, I didn't care what genre it was, I wanted to listen to it. Mm-hmm. And and, and again, kind of going back to the unique timing of, you know, when I was in high school, the early 2000s, like, I know this is kind of a controversial topic, but I, I was an original Napster user. And honestly, I probably wouldn't have gotten into music were it not for Napster. Yeah. Because it, it gave me that access to if I wanted to hear a new record instead of having to, you know, save up my allowance or when I was in high school working summer jobs, save up a couple of weeks of paycheck and then go out, drive all the way out to the mall, dig through the CDs, find something that I liked and hope instead of all of that, I could just pull up Napster and say, okay, I want to hear, you know, Snoop Dogg, or I want to hear the new Nickel Creek album, or what's this over here? And mm-hmm. I got to explore and come in contact with so much music that I never would have gotten to otherwise. So I think that's great that you bring that up. And immediately what's funny is like immediately internally, I feel that little like flicker of self-censorship come yeah. where it's like, <laughs> oh, how do you say this? And do you say this sort of apologetically and, do, and other things? And um, the reason I bring that up is I, where we're headed with this conversation, I think, mm-hmm. is about how that does is shouldn't matter, right? So 
In other words, um, I, you know, I grew up in a world where on the one hand, I knew a guy or I know a guy who actually designed the Napster logo for Napster. And on the other oh, wow. side, I know the guy who was responsible for trying to shut them down. So, right, you know, we live right. in a small world. Um, but at the core of that, you have to, if you want to really um, get into understanding the future of things and technology and how it might help us and where it might help us, you have to be able to accept things like, okay, something like Napster came along. It created an opportunity, um, you know, it created a, an ability for people to, to have access to tons of music suddenly and get it and listen to it and interact with it. And that's, you know, you, you, you have a couple of approaches. You could say like, okay, do we try and police that a lot or do we, um, you know, and, and control it by, by policing a market for, for something? Or do you look at it and go, okay, this is clearly what everybody wants. So how do we pivot and adjust to make something like this work? And, um, you know, a very quick description, I would say that both those things happened, right? You know, there was definitely right. the policing that that finally closed down Napster, in my understanding. And then along came the streaming services and the opportunity for all that stuff. Um, and I'm hinting at this, the topics that we're going to get into today, which is the future of music and Web3 and stuff like that. So I wonder if you right. want to jump in with any thoughts on that that topic. Yeah, definitely. So one of the interesting things, again, you know, being at the time I was what 11, 12 years old in 2000 when uh when Napster was you know Napster how we think of it was a thing and so I've been and I've been following all along uh you know I grew up in a household my dad was a very avid music fan uh, he was never involved in the industry but he was man like going through his record collection of just what he was listening to back in the 70s now you would think he had gone back and curated because it was just all the the best artists. Nice. Um, so like I was always a, a huge music fan, always tapped in and paid paying attention from a very young age. Something that we forget about a lot is Napster was never intended to be a pirate platform. The only reason that that happened was when Sean Parker and them when they built it, they seeded it with content just as like proof of concept. Say, hey, here's the technology. It works. This digital MP3 thing, it's coming whether y'all want it to or not. So we built this and like, let's make this work. And then there was some confusion with some of the rights holders at the time and uh, a lot of generational gap where the technology was so new, even more so than today with NFTs. At the time, computers and the internet was still a new thing. Yeah. So this whole concept of, well, so the songs are digital and there are these MP3s and they're online, but right now, like the files spread across every all these different people's computers and nobody's paying for anything. And there was just kind of a knee jerk reaction from the music industry. And I mean, I remember when I was in college at the time, the RIAA was literally suing grandmas for hundreds of thousands of dollars because their grandkid was down in the basement on the computer torrenting and seeding songs. Yeah, I remember hear, and, reading an article about a bus driver that was yeah. you know, slapped with a, a lawsuit or something like that. Right, and and that's something, so we're, like, I totally understand the copyright infringement side of things, and obviously they should not have been doing that illegally, but the way that the music industry responded with such an iron fist kind of approach, uh, what people don't realize a lot when this conversation comes up is when you're talking about the the fan and industry relationship, when the industry started turning these fans and these grandmothers that had no idea what was even going on as enemies and suing them for hundreds of thousands of dollars over like a couple dozen songs, right? it, it created this big sense of distrust and this big adversarial kind of positioning between the, the music fans and the music industry. And I think that's a big part of what actually caused a lot of the, you know, the financial dip that the yeah. industry saw in the post Napster wave. It was, in my opinion, it was very much caused as much by how the music industry responded to Napster as it was to Napster itself. What what were some of your thoughts going through your head as a teenager, you know, coming up, coming up through that in high school? Do you remember, was it, did you even have thoughts about it at that point? Or was it more just like, oh, this thing's happening out there. I wonder what, what's up with that. 
I did. I mean, I was, I came from a very like old school punk rock background, you know, these days, a lot of, and a lot of people in my generation, when they think punk rock, they're thinking, you know, pop punk, Blink-182. But I was, <laughs> I had ended up coming up in a pocket in my hometown of like even more old school guys than that. Uh, so we were coming at it more with the the mindset of like a lot of the 1970s and 80s, like New York City punk and hardcore mm-hmm. and, and British mm-hmm. punk. So it's a, a lot more anti-authoritarian. Um, so I was a little bit like took took some pride in in piracy at the time. Uh, <laughs> well, sort know, of for better, like for better the anarch- worse, anarchic, yeah, aspects exactly, of it, right? and, and and that's part of it. And and then especially the more that I learned about the music industry and you know how predatory historically a lot of uh, record deals and things have been, you know, part of part of me was like, you know what, the music industry's taken advantage of artists for so long, so like. I would rather pirate the music and then go to the show and buy a T-shirt, buy a vinyl directly from the artist than, you know, at the time, there wasn't even really a good way to buy digital music. You still had to go buy the CD, put the CD in your computer, open up Winamp, rip it, rip it. It was so much work to get digital music. Yeah. And and especially knowing with all that work that the artist was, you know, maybe seeing... 15% 15% of whatever the wholesale was if they had a good deal in place. So I figured, you know, I'm listening to the music. This is kind of, if you think of it in marketing terms, this is the top of the funnel. They've got me as a fan. And now that I like the music, I'm going to go and spend more money directly with the artist in ways that the artist is actually going to see that money. Yeah. And I think it's important to recognize a couple of things. One, two, um, it's not necessary for a high school kid to have to think that deeply about a topic anyway, you know. We right. all have self-interest um, at heart, I guess, if that's a way to say it. I mean, obviously, we we have an interest in the greater picture, too, but it's it's inherent that we want to live and listen and enjoy, and, you know, everybody's sort of looking to um, do better, whatever that means, uh, right. in a given situation. So, therefore... Like any high school kid, you know, might see like access to something that's free or accessible and just say, great, you know. Um, and then, yes, you, you, it's important um, and it's wonderful to have an ass, have a perspective that says, hey, this is really the, the right move here or this is the way to really give back. And when you're describing like wanting to go to the show and get the T-shirt, that implies also that you, um, which is, again, going to be part of this larger story of what's coming next with NFTs and stuff, that implies that you found yourself in a bit of a relationship with that band or artist so that you knew who they were and cared about it and wanted them to do well or succeed or whatever, you know? Um, right. Gosh, what was the other part of that that I was going to say too? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think it's important for us to not forget that the that revolution is at the heart of rock and roll in a lot of ways, right? So always the the rebellious attitude of somebody in the marketplace like that, which is whatever fancy way that was to say the the rebellious attitude of a teenager thinking like, oh, I can get this song for free over here, yeah, or can I get a copy from you? You know, there's nothing new about that in the 2000s. When I was in the 80s, you know, um, it, taping a record. The industry was tearing their hair out over it, like, oh, people can just record it onto a cassette and they didn't go buy the record. So that's that's always been there because that's the nature of what people want to do. Um, but before we rather than um, you know, describe that nature in some kind of uh critical fashion, let's recognize that it's that very nature that that also fuels the revolution in music and rock and roll that makes it so worth listening to and gets us excited. So I just wanted to, I just wanted to add that in there. Oh, absolutely. And the other thing that, that like you're saying goes hand in hand with that, that rock and roll rebellious spirit and the nature of how music was being consumed at the time is music was so much more social at the time. You know, this was largely pre social media, you know, when I was in high school, putting on those shows and playing with the punk bands, MySpace was in its heyday. So we had that a little bit, the early phases of that. Yeah. But it was more about community. You know, it was when we would go to go to school, when we'd be waiting in the cafeteria or or in, in the band room at lunch, it would be, Hey, what new music have you been listening to? And we would be sharing burnt CDs, burnt mixtape CDs back and forth. And this is how we were discovering new artists. On that, another great aspect of 
music at the time was the social side of it. It wasn't just, oh, hey, we've got access to all this music. Let's go download as much as we can. It was logging on to AIM chat rooms and at school in the cafeteria before school, after class, uh, in the hallways, talking with our friends of like, hey, you got to hear this new song that I just found on Napster. It, uh, it's so good. And we would share burnt mix CDs and that's how we would discover new music. And most of the time, if there was a song that we really liked, we weren't just ripping everything off off of Napster. We were almost using it as, you know, for those of us that are old enough to remember going into brick and mortar record shops, they used to have these uh, boxes on the wall that would have headphones hooked into them. And it, you'd push a, like a membrane button for the different records and you could listen to part of one of the songs from the record. So that way you could hear it before you bought it. So it was kind of That's our right. version our version of that, we would, you know, if, if there was a song we really liked, we'd say, oh, who's that? And then go find out, listen to more of their stuff. And if we really liked it, you know, we would take that trip out to the mall, to the record store, take our $20 and buy the CD. Or go to the show, you know, or start, or go to start the show, following yeah. the band and become a fan. Exactly. And it was huge for, for the local bands too, uh, because we could, you know, especially at the time, there was no distro kid, there was no CD baby. You couldn't get your music into record stores or the marketplaces unless you had a label relationship. So for some of us having the ability to say, hey, you know, we're not in a position to get our record pressed to CD and get it in record stores, but we can upload it to Napster and we may not make money off of that part of it, but people are going to hear our music. And so that aspect of it too, from from the underground artist standpoint, there were a handful of artists that made uh, Soldier Boy, I think, made great use of Napster and and uh, mm. some of the P2P platforms at the time. Okay, cool. In my studio, I chose the OWC Mini Stack STX Thunderbolt 4 Certified Storage and Expansion Hub because it seamlessly connects to my Mac Mini M1 for my dedicated audio drives, sample libraries, and backup drives. It's the perfect size to stack with the Mac Mini and add storage and connectivity over Thunderbolt or USB. Whether you have the new or older Mac Mini, nothing stacks up in your studio quite like OWC. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. Ever wonder how I get a consistent sound quality mixing hundreds of episodes of Recording Studio Rockstars? It's because I've been cheating by using Isotope, RX, Ozone, and Neutron on every single episode. Right now, you are hearing RX Breath Control, D-Click, D-Clip, DS, D-Plosive, Voice Denoise, Ozone Multiband Compression, Neutron EQ, and Limiting, all from Isotope. Try out the subscription option for yourself with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. All right, well, so that was then. This is now. What are some things that are that you're seeing come along that, that remind you of the, the Napster thing happening and the need for kind of a new era of music and distribution and, you know, just allowing a musician and an artist to reap the rewards of what their creations are, you know? Yeah. So the big thing obviously is NFTs. It's been the topic at the, in, in the front of everybody's minds uh, for, I guess, about a little over a year now. Yeah. Um, Believe it or not, this is our yeah. first NFT interview on recording studio rock stars, though. <laughs> yeah, and it's and, and it's interesting because it it is still very early in the development of NFTs and smart contracts and how they get utilized in the wider marketplace. Mm -hmm. Even with all the buzz and all the hype right now, uh, some of my friends uh, that we work with this stuff full time, we keep reminding ourselves like we're just now getting to the Netscape phase of things. Like we may or may not even be to the Napster phase of this stuff yet. Right, right. Um, like it's still so early that a lot of the technology, like the fund fundamentals are there, but a lot of the platforms and the streaming services, like they just haven't been built yet. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see uh, between now and when the episode comes out, that how much will have changed. Right. Uh, how many platforms have established themselves. I really think that this summer, the summer of 2022 is going to be 
one of the biggest changes that we've seen in the overall music landscape, media landscape in probably close to a generation since the early 2000s when everything went online, just because there's so much potential with a lot of this technology and it really is giving control back to creators. So I'm sure that there will still be things that look like traditional record deals that will still exist. But as far as how you consume the product and how you interact with with that artist's work is going to be largely through NFTs and smart contract interactions. I love it. I love it. I'm so excited about it. So um, this, uh, I guess we're going to have to pivot, you know, leap around a little bit here. But yeah. um, let, let me start by asking you this uh, basic question for the rock stars. What is an NFT? What is an NFT? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so an NFT, it's what's called a non-fungible token. And there's going to be a lot of, real quick before I get too far into this, there's going to be a lot of very techy, buzzwordy sounding things. Um, so Liz, for, for you, if there's anything that I can clarify better, don't hesitate to jump in. Okay. And also I've got links uh, that I can send you to include with the show notes uh, that are some great kind of like 101. That's awesome. Introductory yeah. kind of articles. And, and let me also put this in context, rock stars. If we were early, if we were describing how Netscape work, worked, there could also have been very deep conversations about very techy stuff. But as we all know, um, the most techy stuff we usually have to deal with day to day is, oh crap, what's my password for my email account? Mm-hmm. You know, so that's that's where this stuff is headed as we get into it. So don't let the tech stuff uh, fool you. Right. It's so tech tech focused right now, again, because it's still so early. Once these tools get built and developed out, the user experience is going to get easier and easier to the point where you don't even have to think about it. You just, hey, I want to buy that album. You pull out your phone, open up MetaMask or your wallet, you send them some ETH, and then you've got your NFT. And I know that may sound like gibberish to some of you right now, <laughs> but hopefully by the end of this episode, you'll at least be able to go back and be like, oh, okay, I know what that means when he says all that. That's a trip. Just as an aside, man, do you do you enjoy the fact that ETH sounds almost like your first name? Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually, on my Twitter, I've actually changed my name so the ETH in my first name is capitalized. Right on, man. So it's awesome. Ethan X That's Howard. Great. That's great. All right, so uh, as we got so far as to say NFTs are non-fungible tokens, people are yeah. beginning to <laughs> snore. So let's keep going. Right. Keep going. What What does that mean? So a non-fungible token just means, so it's a token, which is a representative item, uh, and non-fungible means that it's not interchangeable. So for every non-fungible token, a good way to think about it, uh, a way that I think will make sense uh, for a lot of the rock stars listening is like how a lot of studio equipment has a serial number. Right. It's very much the same. So you can have an album and it's kind of like a, like a pressing of an album. You can have however many, whether it's a one of one or 10,000 in that one print run. And if you do a 10,000 of it, each each one of those will have its own unique identifier. So some fan bases uh, have numbers that hold special significance within the fan base. And so maybe number uh, 22 or number 33 has a special significance to the artist or somebody or the community. And so that particular copy of it, the same way that say an early Beatles first print, first pressing Beatles vinyl has extra value because it's that first pressing Beatles vinyl, the same thing's going to apply to some of these tokens where certain, uh, certain numbers in the edition are going to hold extra value. And so, yeah. yeah. And And so when thinking about like non-fungible versus fungible, so an example of something that would be fungible is a dollar. One dollar is one dollar is one dollar. It doesn't matter what bill it is, if it's a paper dollar, if it's a dollar coin, if it's a stack of quarters, it's one dollar. Uh, let me let me add to that. So if you um if if somebody gave you a dollar for something and then I came along and gave that first person a dollar they would see it as the same dollar, even though it was a different dollar. That's the way exactly. to think about fungible, right? And non-fungible is like, or like if if you gave me a strat and then I gave it to somebody else and then they came along and gave you a different strat later, you might go like, oh, cool, it's a strat. I, yeah, thanks, we're, we're good now. Or you might go, 
No, this is not the same strat that I gave you. Right. So the same the, an, an NFT, a non fungible token, means it's got to be this exact same identical strat, right? Right. And, well, and even with that exact same identical strats, any of us that have played, especially hand built instruments, know that sometimes you could have two that on paper are exactly the same, but one might have a slight inconsistency in the wood that makes it play different or voice differently. And yeah. so those still would be would be non fungible, even if they're the exact same model. They've got two; they're made out of two different chunks of wood. They've got two separate serial numbers. Yeah. And so those are still going to be non fungible. So so NFT, we could. I don't know if we need to keep talking about non fungible, but yeah. um, <laughs> just NFT rock stars. And NFT essentially to me means this is a one of a kind item that is that now can be exchanged digitally through the internet, but it's it's provable, like. This is the actual item. Once you have it, you have it. The the person who gave it to you no longer has it. Is that a good way to think of it? That's correct. Yeah. And 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 with crypto assets and like NFT assets, they function as what's called bearer assets. So it's not like with, you know, with a bank, if you know if something happens, you can go to the bank and they can reverse transactions, fix it for you. With crypto and NFTs, you have what's called a private key in a seed phrase, which are like your, it's like your key to your safety deposit box that is your wallet. Mm -hmm. And the security is totally up to you. So if you lose that seed phrase or that private key, then the bank or whoever can't go back in and get to it. So that's another big, big consideration. Um, There have been some instances, uh, like you'll read articles about Bitcoin, where people who had a hard drive with, you know, 100 Bitcoin on it, lost the private key and threw the hard drive away. And they've spent the last several years digging through, literally digging through landfills trying to find. Yeah, yeah, I know that story. That's a British guy. (laughs) Yeah, there's a couple of them. Because for reference, you know, back in what, 2013, a Bitcoin was maybe $5. Right, right. And I haven't looked at it today, but it's trending in what, somewhere around $45,000. I'll find out for you right now, because this is going to be funny, because for those of you so, and we'll come back to this rock stars, why we're even talking about Bitcoin. So we'll cover that too when we're on this NFT topic. So obviously we're here for the music aspect of this all. But um, one thing about the world of cryptocurrencies is that they tend to go up and down a lot still, which means that by the time this comes out, uh, right now it says the price of Bitcoin is $44,555. So that will either be like, when this comes out, it'll be like, oh, look, it's whatever, it's that, or it'll or it'll be like, oh man, whew, you know, like dodged a bullet right. there, or it'll be like, holy crap, I should have. Or it'll why be, didn't I? Know, <laughs> it might be one hundred forty four thousand by the time the episode exactly. comes out. It, exactly, there's no way to know. There's no way to know. All right, so, um, <clears throat> gosh, uh, the NFT thing. So, I had a thought about where to pivot with that, but essentially, it's like a thing that can be exchanged. Oh, you were talking about the bank and the bearer asset. Again, those are scary words for people listening to this too. But I will say that, think about it like this, Rockstars. If you have a phone and you lose your phone or it falls in the lake and it's destroyed, a lot of times the backup is, you know, through Apple or something and you can then just, you know, restore your phone and with a new phone and now you have the same phone, right? Right. Or, and that that is possible in some ways with that world of crypto and wallets and stuff. But another way to think about it when people say private keys is imagine that that phone is the one phone you have. Don't destroy it. Don't lose it because nobody can help you get it back if you do. That's kind of the right. way to think about it. And one of the reasons why we should give a shit about that is because it also means that um somebody can't come along and take it away from you without your permission, you know? So you actually have the thing, right? Exactly. And that's the biggest thing. There have been, uh, over the last couple of weeks from when we're uh, recording this episode now uh, in February, there's been a couple of fairly high profile security issues where uh, people, particularly with the Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs, which is one of the big blue chip, they're the ones that, you know, Justin Bieber just bought one a couple of weeks ago for over a million dollars. for. Good uh, Lord. A profile picture of an of a cartoon ape, <laughs> um, but uh, you know you say it that way, and it's like oh, and I think that's why a lot of people are like, what? It's just a JPEG, and why people are writing off NFTs. But there's so much more behind that with how the token works, the community around it, and we'll get into some of those aspects yeah. later because they 
you know, obviously t- talking about community, it ties directly into how it applies with music in the music industry. Uh, but th- there were a couple of instances where part of it was one uh, an exploit on one of the marketplaces where people would go and sell these. Uh, but then also there's uh, some scams going around where these bad actors are tricking people into giving them their private key or their seed phrase. And they're using that to take over their account and steal all of their NFTs, all of their any any cryptocurrency, any Ethereum or Bitcoin or Avalanche, whatever that they've got in that wallet. It gives that bad act. Basically, you're giving them the the login credentials for your crypto right. account. So you got to be careful. And right. a lot of us listening here, rock stars, uh, you you will be familiar with the emergence of the internet and people going like. Are you crazy? You put your credit card information on a website? What are you nuts? You know, and right. then so think about it like that. Uh, we're we're in the early stage still, but clearly down the road just a little bit. Not even that far down the road, I think, because I also think that the evolution of technical technological developments are sort of exponentially increasing. I don't know if it's really exponential, but there things are moving faster now than they were when the internet first arrived. Um, but Absolutely. you know, it wasn't long before it was like, oh yeah, of course I'm buying all my Southwest airline tickets on, on their website. Cause you know, you just buy four of them and you get a free one, you know, <laughs> right? and you don't even think about putting your credit card in there, but there were still some things that you had to be, you know, smart about. So it's the same right. thing with the NFT stuff. So, you know, as it sounds like we're getting into the weeds about it, really, it's just the difference of saying you have to be careful in certain ways now. And later, those things won't even be something to worry about. Right. And and the biggest thing is just it's just a, account security, whether it's crypto accounts or your social media logins, just having control and security over your over your accounts is really the most important thing, uh, especially with with crypto and NFT, because the amount of money that we're seeing people make with these, if you do, you know, slip up and and somebody manages to take over your wallet, you could lose, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of digital assets. Sure, sure. Imagine like you had bought, you know, collectible first pressings of famous double albums and and all of a sudden they became, you know, they went up to many hundreds of dollars for a collector's, as a collector's item. But then I think what you're describing is, imagine that you had the whole store full of those you know, or you had you had a a room where you were putting all those albums, and somebody just came in and and got them all at once. So you have to be careful, right, that you don't let anybody have access to your stuff. But um, I I think it would be awesome. So let's go into um starting to talk about you know why do we care about this stuff and what's coming for NFTs yeah. and how it applies to music. Fifty years ago, William G. Dilley introduced the world to his revolutionary new dynamics processor, the Model 610 Complimenter. A truly unique device, the Model 610 was not only the fastest, cleanest, and quietest of its type, but was also capable of providing completely separate peak limiting and compression functions. Today, Spectra 1964 introduces the Model C610 Complimenter, described as the most versatile piece of audio gear you can buy. Great for adding control and power to everything from vocals, guitars, and bass, to mixing and even mastering, the C610 gives you the same massive sound that rocked legendary studios like Stax, Arden, AdVision, A&M, and Record Plant. It even has enough gain to function as a mic preamp. I'm using the C610 on every record I make at the Toy Box Studio, and you should too. You'll love it. Go to spectra1964.com or call 801-797-0642. So you just finished an awesome mix and sent it off to the band, but the singer texts you with lyric changes, the drummer emails you wanting a different fill, and the bass player DMs you about a wrong note in the chorus. But which mix version were they talking about anyway? Don't you wish there was an easier way? Samply.app comes to the rescue as your ultimate mix assistant, streaming full resolution audio so your clients can easily listen and send notes from their mobile phone on the road or the computer 
computer back at the studio. All mix comments are time stamped directly onto the correct mix version with no confusion. And you also get AB listening capability with synchronized playback and level matching for easy mix comparison all inside Sampley. It's file sharing that was built specifically for music and it all works inside your browser with no downloads required. Sign up now for your free account with 25 gigs of storage and unlimited projects and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade at Sampley.app. Hey, Rockstars, we're back now for the jam session. Um, the second half of the show, my guest today is Ethan X. Howard. Very cool name. And we're going to continue talking about NFTs and the future of music and what that means to you. So, Ethan, are you ready to jam, dude? Let's jam. All right. Eth. <laughs> I love it, man. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's let's keep pivoting back because uh, I get really excited about this stuff. But I have to be careful that I don't sound like I'm at a Bitcoin meetup somewhere, you know? <laughs> right. So um, talk about um, what, what what is it, the things we were talking about, how something, an NFT tr means something unique, something tradable through the internet, something that will become more easy to use, something that will become more easy to use without it being, feeling risky and dangerous, you know? So right. all those things aside... What the hell is it and what, what what can it have to do with music, for example? Yeah, so ultimately, um, something I, I like to remind people is at the end of the day, an NFT is just a new transaction mechanism. So it, it's being viewed a lot as this crazy, fancy new media format. But at the end of the day, it's just we're kind of updating the cash registers and the cash registers can do a whole lot more than they used to. Nice. Uh, so, th so that's kind of my favorite way of thinking about all of it, because we we've all seen the you know the the animal profile picture series where there's ten thousand you know of wh whatever animal it is. There's been everything from apes to lions to cats, and they all look the same. And it's like, well, what makes these worth so much money? And most of the time, the answer is the additional utility and the community value around those NFTs. So a lot of what we're seeing and a lot of the really cool use cases for music are, so say you buy an NFT from an artist that you really love, and then one of the additional perks that you get for owning that NFT is, say, access to the fan club. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, out of all the artists that are into NFTs and have released NFTs, one of the best implementations I've seen so far is Yanni. If wow. we remember Yanni, Yanni, yeah, Yanni live at the Acropolis. Live at the Acropolis. Yeah, I found myself uh, watching that video the other night. Just I, one of those things where I just came across it and was watching it, and sent the video to one of my friends. And then when I sent him the message where it populates like the the video preview off of YouTube, I saw in the description there Yanni new NFT, and was like, "What Yanni?" <laughs> uh, but it looked at it and it's brilliant the way that he's got it laid out. You buy the NFT. And then that gives you access to his entire fan community, all the private fan chat rooms, uh, VIP ticket pre-sales. By owning that NFT, you get access to all those things that traditionally would have been the role of the fan club or, you know, five different marketing agencies working together with the promoter, whatever. Interesting. It can all be done in one place with the NFT. And there are these services, and we're seeing also NFTs getting used with ticketing. Uh, companies like Yellowheart are one of the leaders in that, where you own the NFT and you buy the NFT, which is basically just a really fancy digital code. And then uh, you log into a service that validates that you own that NFT. And then that's the equivalent of scanning the barcode on the Ticketmaster scanner. Mm -hmm. to get into the concert. So uh, uh, let me let me think of some examples. So for example, if you bought an NFT for a movie that you wanted to go to see, mm -hmm. um, not right now, before that, if I wanted to go see a movie, I'd have to decide what theater I was going to go see it at, and I'd have to buy a ticket on a website that would be good for that particular theater in that particular time. But theoretically, with an NFT, you could just buy an NFT for that movie and you could go to any theater you wanted um, at any time. Obviously, there are limitations. Right. You know, the, yeah. Full, the, theoretically, like, yeah, theoretically. In, in practice, I don't really foresee the studios 
the movie studio is going for something like that, it'll mm-hmm. still probably look theater by theater, but it'll be something very similar to that. And when you go see the the movie, instead of how, you know, I used to do this when I was a kid. I'm sure a lot of other people do save your ticket stubs. So with NFTs, you can also have some incredible art specific to that show, that movie, that you have that as a collectible for until you get rid of it. Right, either give it away, right. sell it. So that way it's the same thing as being able to, you know, being able to say, oh, I went to the very first showing of Back to the Future or Harry Potter or whatever. It's right. the same deal. It's kind right. of the same idea as, you know, you've got that original ticket stub, but with NFTs, you've got this really rich piece of digital art that also helps commemorate yeah. that event. Okay. So so with Yanni's example, um, getting an getting his NFT maybe it gets you the music or maybe it's attached to making a purchase of an album or something like that, but it also comes with it the ability to then use that to, you know, scan code your way, right. or code scan your way into each different fan club area, um, whatever exactly. that means. It could literally get you into a physical club too. You could actually just scan it on the way in the door and you walk in and you're in the VIP thing. But um, one of the things that I think is important for people to understand too is because sometimes people look and they're like, whatever, what's the big deal? You just go to some website that just says you got the code and and you do it. But the the some website example I just referred to means you'd have to have a centralized place that is running that and making it happen. And if you know, if the, right. they don't stick around or whatever. And what if you want to go sell your tickets? Like I remember once I bought um tickets. I wanted to take my daughter when she was little to the the uh, Nutcracker. So I went on Craigslist and I had to find somebody that was had some extra tickets and they were trying to sell them through the scalping thing. Um, and that right. kind of a pain, kind of hard to do. But in this NFT world, because it's functioning on this blockchain cryptocurrency kind of theme, um, not even kind of, it just is, <laughs> it means <Right>. that <clears throat> you can easily send it to somebody else. Somebody else can easily exactly. purchase it from you and it and it is now transacted. Now the other person has it. You don't have to meet face to face. You don't have to put it in Craig's list. You don't have to go to some right. hub stub thing or, you know. And, mo- and most importantly, because it's on the blockchain, which is a publicly verifiable ledger of all these transactions, you don't have to worry about, you know, okay, I bought these tickets on StubHub. Did the seller sell the same ticket code to 10 other people? Yeah as well, or is this even a real code to begin with on Craigslist? I mean, how many times have we, we've all known people, if you buy secondhand tickets, at some point you've, you've encountered that, or you know, somebody who's encountered that where they've bought a ticket and then it's a multiple duplicate code. So somebody else already used it, or it was not real to begin with, but NFTs, before you even purchase it, you can go back and validate, make sure that it's an official ticket. So it, eliminates that huge sector of of ticket scammers right now that have been operating. And additionally, this is one of the most exciting things to me personally. With NFTs, you can program in a secondary sales royalty, which means that any time that that NFT gets sold or resold, the creator of the NFT gets a royalty payment on that. So like right, right now, if if I bought a ticket to a concert, the artist and promoter get that revenue broke split out however they've agreed to split it out but then if i sell the ticket to you for say say it's a sold out show crazy demand i paid a hundred dollars face value for the ticket and i sell it to you for five hundred dollars right now with StubHub and and everything that exists now the artist doesn't see a cent of that but with nfts they can program in a royalty so that say if, if the demand goes way up and i sell you the ticket for five times face value the original artist is going to see 10% of that additional transaction. Yeah, that's very cool. I'll use an analogy that we would be familiar with. So traditionally, you know, an artist makes a record. Let's use a physical copy like a CD. I'll back up in time a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, A band makes a CD. It makes its way to a record store and gets sold the first time. Um, Maybe the band did it through the label, whatever, uh, or maybe they did it themselves. But that initial sale of the record is the only time that the band and the label would get paid for the sale of that record. And then 
along came all these used record stores, and now the used CD could go in there and they get resold. And I'm not aware of any way that the artists or the labels were able to participate in the resale of the record. I'm certainly happy for used record stores. Don't get me wrong. Any of this is fantastic. I mean, there's nothing quite so fun as going into a record store and browsing around for new music. Um, but in this future of it, if that CD went into the record store, then was owned by somebody else later, and then they sold it and it went to a new record store and was sold again. The artist or the label or whoever was the creator of that thing could continue to participate in the life cycle of what they had created. Absolutely. And especially when we're living in, you know, the what is it, the long tail, the world of the long tail, every transaction in the secondary market adds up and counts. Exactly. So here's what's fascinating to me about that too, is it begins to create a model for creatives that says, if this thing turns out to be really appreciated over a long period of time, then you're in it to win it if you're part right. of that that creation, you know, as opposed to the traditional model, which is like, you know, you need somebody like a, a record label to come along and, and take a big gamble on you. Like, are you a sure bet? You know, are you going to be the one? Are you going to be part of the 8% that supports the 92% of our roster of right. artists that don't <laughs> recoup what we put into it? You know, that kind of stuff. And it might help restructure an entire kind of investment business model around making things in music where it's like, I, I just... It's exciting to me, the idea of, uh, especially coming from a DIY and punk background, you know, the idea of like, hey, man, let's just do this thing together and let's all contribute and let's let's all put our effort and work into it. And if it does great, there's other aspects to this too. Like things don't just do great on their own. There's always a lot more work to be done. But if this right. thing can succeed, then we're, we're all going to do well with it. Even if one part of that group or party says, I, I just don't want to have to keep hustling anymore. You know, I want to, I did my part. I'd like to relax now. It'd be right. nice if the world reflects the original contribution in a good way. Oh, absolutely. And the other great thing too, is seeing the amount of value that musicians are being able to capture, even right now in this very early stage, the amount of value in terms of like dollars that they're able to capture off of just one music NFT drop. There are a couple of platforms that are already out there. Uh, Sound.xyz is one of the big ones. And then there's also Catalog, which is another big audio NFT platform uh, where the main NFTs are audio uh, buying records. And there are artists, uh, they do... I really love how Sound does it. Every time their artist has a release, an NFT release they do a virtual listening party where they're on Twitter spaces, they're on their Discord and their live chat. They have an event on the website where they turn it into an event again, which is, you know, it's kind of funny. All these like brand new revolutionary things are just hearkening back to how things used to be back in the day. You know, you have a, a release, you, you do a release party. Makes sense, right? Yeah, I'm doing one and, this week. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. And so they're doing that. And... These artists are the way that sound is set up is there's 25 editions of the same song. So there's 25 editions of the one NFT and each one sells for 0.1 ETH. So by the time they sell out of that first 20, it's equivalent of selling 25 copies of the CD or of the song and they're making 2.5 ETH, which one Ethereum right now is what, right around $3,000, $3,200? Yeah, it's up, it's up over 3200 at the moment. It's been moving fast yeah. this week. And so 2.1 ETH and, you know, a lot of them are selling out for 30 in within 30 minutes. And that's the equivalent, uh, to put it in perspective, the ballpark numbers for Spotify takes, a, what, about a million streams to make about $5,000? I think something like that, yeah. So however long it takes, and these are artists that the level that, they're on in their careers, you know, they're not household names. These aren't your Drakes and your Rihannas. These are new up and coming artists. They're fantastic. So it's not like they just picked up music, like they've been at it for a while and they're good and they already have some fan base, but they're not artists that would release on Spotify and rack up a million streams in a week. All right. Let's talk a little bit about what NFTs are doing at the moment in terms of releasing a record, having 
like help us help us visualize this too because i know it'll change right. and i like to think of this stuff as don't worry about having all the answers just yet the answers will come um in the same way that the emergence of the internet and mp3s and and the way people started to listening to music and the way eventually the car manufacturers just make cars that play the right. music that way. You know, it's like I watched, I had all these cars and I watched them go from like, um, having a cassette to having a cassette and a CD to not having a cassette anymore to not having a CD anymore. <laughs> you know, right. It's just like, right. It's the, the world reflects the, you know, what's going on already with it, with that stuff. But right now, if somebody went and, and I pulled up the website, so sound.xyz, is that the one, the first one you were talking about? That's it. Okay. And then the other one, is it the enter.audio or is that the wrong one? Uh, no, it's catalog. I'm not sure what their, what their domain is. Okay. Um, catalog we'll NFT. We'll uh, ca catalog. Yeah. It's like an episode of Joe Rogan. Catalog. Stars. We're searching works. things in real time on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, you, you need to have your Jimmy. Hey, I'll uh, pull it up. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So here I have, catalog um i might not sure to look at the right one anyway but let me go to the one that i'm i'm sure of so mm -hmm. sound.xyz um pretty simple page i get there um you can search artists and releases it has trending and then there's something called open which we'll get into which i basically that's just a marketplace for this stuff at the moment right it's a place it's like right. if you needed to sell something used along came ebay and then now we got a place to sell sell and buy stuff from each other and then exactly. there's, yeah, there's an artist at the top and it's like uh, available NFTs um, and the price and stuff like that. And view song, latest sounds. So this is a label or this is a marketplace for, for creating stuff. Could so, I go there and make one right now if I wanted? So it's a marketplace and right now they're invite only. So, and that's something that we're seeing a lot uh, with music NFTs is right now it's very highly curated. Uh, and that's one of those things where people argue both sides on that. It's right now it, it's curated kind of out of necessity. There's so much interest that if they let everybody do it, it would be overwhelming. And there, uh, it's kind of the same thing that's going on with Spotify, where there's over sixty thousand songs added every day. Right. It's like how do you how do you sift through all of that? And also, these platforms are new enough; they want to make sure that they're not wasting the fans' time and the fans' money because a lot of these, you know. The NFTs sell for 0.1 ETH, but it's important to note that's not a small amount of money. Like that's it's the equivalent of about three hundred dollars yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, right now in February, that's 0.1 ETH is like three hundred some dollars. So it's not a small amount of money. So they don't want to be, you know, wasting people's time and money and having the fans have to sort through and be like, oh, well, sort through five things that shouldn't have gotten released to find the one really good thing. Right. Okay. Uh, well, and, and it's going to open up as, as the technology grows and more people figure it out, it's going to open up to where anybody will be able to get on the platforms. The same way that Spotify, when it came out, you know, you had to right. have a label deal and now anybody can. Yeah. Just or, within or a SoundCloud. Time. SoundCloud. There's exactly. always like SoundCloud, a bunch of stuff yeah. where you're like, why am I hearing this? And then other stuff exactly. that's like, this is great. Exactly. Um, so let's 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 skip past that. Let's assume that that part will get sorted out. Um, what does it mean to create an NFT and put it out there now? I mean, my understanding is it's this digital item, verification item, and you can upload a song to it, an MP3. I don't know if you can upload a WAV file. I assume you could. You could upload a video or text or an image. Mm -hmm. um, you can upload a digital file essentially that's connected to this thing right right and so the interesting thing right now is so whatever media assets they don't get stored directly on the blockchain as part of the nft um, just because the way that the blockchain works right now and the way that the ethereum network works it just can't handle that extra data and it would cause mm. transactions to be so expensive that it it's just too expensive. So there's other platforms and other tools like the IPFS, the Inter Interplanetary yeah. File System. Love that which name. Is, <laughs> oh, yeah, right? And it's really, and this kind of loops back around earlier. It's kind of interesting. It's basically the same kind of peer-to-peer -peer technology that Napster was built on. So we're kind of almost like we we hit the pause button for 20 years and now we're back to using, oh, hey, that technology actually is better and makes way more sense. 
when you've got the files distributed over a network of computers instead of all coming from one centralized server. Yeah. So now uh, we're it, talking about, um, I've forgotten the names of them actually, but I was really fascinated by it. Basically, Rock says, if you think about a cloud, like your Dropbox account, for example, that is, those are all centralized private servers that are owned by Dropbox. The mechanics of maybe you know, which computer is your stuff on at, the, at any given moment, that might be a little bit more complex than the way I described it. But along through the blockchain world comes these ideas of saying, hey, what if we incentivize people and build systems where everybody with their own personal computer who has extra hard drive space on it can offer up a little bit of their computer as the storage place for stuff? You know, can can there be an enormous worldwide or, you know, universe-wide, I guess, uh, right. um, system of networked computers wherein you don't need to use a paid service over here. You, it's, you know, it's kind of tied into um, the blockchain style. Uh, and I guess there's there, there always has to be incentive. So we began this by me saying, like, we're all looking out for ourselves, and that's just the nature of it. Um, at the core of all these topics is game theory. And that's really right. important to understand. And, and um, that's one of the things that I love about uh, uh, Vitalik Buterin's f- the founder, one of the founders of Ethereum is, you know, he really gets that and he understands the importance of that stuff. But, mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm risking going on a tangent here, but with this <laughs> open cloud stuff and IPFS, you can have everybody's computers are hooked up. You might, for example, make some of your hard drive available that earns you tokens so that when you're out with your phone, you're accessing the network on other people's hard drives and using those tokens or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar to that. And and another good way to think about it is, you know, if you have the file, uh, video streaming is where this is going to be the most noticeable. So like right now, if you're streaming off of, say, Netflix or YouTube, that file is coming straight from that one server. So if there's a lot of congestion, you're going to have to deal with a lot of buffering. Whereas with a distributed delivery service like IPFS, uh, it's whoever has that file on their connected hard drive, it'll pull a little bit of it from this computer over here. It'll pull the next section from this computer over here, wherever the file Hmm. is available. Sounds a little bit like early Napster, except this time it's different. Right. The peer-to-peer technology that it's all built on same philosophy, same technological underpinnings. It's just this time we're trying to make sure that all the rights are taken care of ahead of time. <laughs> yes, exactly. We're trying to get it right this time. So this time around, instead of the bus driver having a full MP3 of a song in a folder that gets completely served to somebody else, where along comes the uh, music police and says, hey, you just gave away a copy of that song, the the bus driver's just got some portion of a computer that's got bits and pieces of parts of things and does you don't even know what's in there really essentially and that gets that gets uh, that's part of this bigger network it makes the thing in this case we're talking about music the the music available to the person who needs it but that person who needs the music can't even get to it without the right kind of permissions and that's where nft comes in does that sound right. fair Yep, it does. Yeah. And and I know we're kind of bouncing around. This is one of the one of the trickiest parts about NFTs and all of this is there's so many aspects of it that it's so easy to to kind of get overwhelmed. And that's something I always like to remind people, including myself on a daily basis, like bite like don't bite off more than you can chew. Don't get overwhelmed. If it starts feeling like it's too much, just take a breath and look at the the whatever topic is most relevant to you. That's kind of a reminder for myself right there because I already feel myself starting to get, oh, well, this part of NFTs and that part. Yeah. Adam Audio introduces the new A7V monitor for home and pro studios, the next generation of the incredibly popular A7X. The all new A series line of monitors delivers the same highly accurate transparent sound and unique accelerated ribbon tweeter design that has made Adam Audio famous for over a decade, but now includes new innovations such as the rotatable high frequency propagation system waveguide, allowing the XART tweeter to disperse sound with controlled consistency. 
and DSP-based room correction and speaker voicings. Using the A-Control software or Sonarworks and measurement mic, you can now integrate advanced filters directly to the DSP onboard the speaker to help compensate for imperfect room acoustics without introducing annoying latency or requiring plugins. This allows you to tune your monitors for your room, your mix position, and your ears anytime you want to meet your ever-evolving studio needs. Get the extended five-year warranty for monitors that will improve as your studio improves at adamaudio.com. Look, it might be hard to describe in a few words what gives records a legendary sound, but it would be pretty easy to describe in a few letters, API. For more than 50 years, API Audio has created large format consoles for world-class studios. Famous for co-founder Saul Walker's circuit designs and original 2520 op amp, the sound of API consoles is the sound of great music. API now brings that legendary sound to your home studio with The Box, a small format console featuring the famous API circuitry that is the perfect analog addition to your digital studio. The Box gives you eight recording channels on the left with built-in mic pre's, high-pass filters, direct inputs, customizable 500 module slots, and 16 summing channels on the right. Or you can mix using all 24 channels, including AUG Sense, inserts, and silky smooth faders. API now offers a virtual console experience with a personalized online demo of the Box 16082 or 2448 console. Sign up for your demo now at apiaudio.com. There was, a, there was a, some guys I was following early on. It was sort of a business podcast, but they had this thing called Just-In-Time Learning. <laughs> which is <laughs> yeah. a philosophy. It's like, it, when it feels overwhelming, just wait till you need to know the one thing and then go learn it right then, which is, you know, our right. Google experience. But um, exactly. Okay. So, so let me, let me ask the question that people want to ask. Uh, why would I pay a bunch of money for um, an NFT of a file that gives me an MP3 when I can just go listen to that MP3 on a streaming service or just go get it somewhere else? Like what? You know, I could just copy it anyway. So what's right. what's the point of it? So uh, go ahead so, and tackle that. You've heard that right. one before. Right. And, and that's a big one right now. Um, right now, the answer is, you know, would you contribute to that artist's GoFundMe or that artist's Kickstarter? Uh, it's very much a similar... Right now, it's a very kind of similar thing. It's as much about being a patron and supporting the artist because you know that when you give that money in that NFT transaction the artist is getting the money. There's not a series of middlemen. There's not, you know, platforms taking a 20% cut here and a 15% cut there. It's going straight to the artist. Another thing that's important, you know, we are so early in all of this that, I, I mean, I can't stress enough how early we are in everything. So what NFT music will look like once it, is fully developed and reaches maturity is going to look very differently from what it is now. Mm -hmm. My, my prediction could be right, could be wrong, but this is what makes sense to me. The technology just isn't built yet is it's going to look something like a combination between Napster, iTunes store and Spotify yeah. where you, you buy the song and it'll, and again, we're not there yet, but once we get there, I think the price for music NFTs, audio NFTs is going to end up evening out about what we've always, where we've always had albums traditionally priced somewhere in that 10 to 20, maybe $30 for the, the fancy ones, that kind of 10 to $30 price range for an album. And one of the big differences too with iTunes, uh, not a lot of people know this, but when you bought songs off of iTunes, you never actually fully owned that copy of the song. Hmm. You, so you couldn't turn around and say you spent $5,000 downloading songs on iTunes. You can't turn around and sell them. And it, it's not even a question of does the artist get paid if you sell them? You legally cannot sell them because you did not purchase a copy. It's you were purchasing a license to stream that file. Yeah. And so you couldn't, you couldn't even sell your music on iTunes. Once you spend it, Apple had the money. 
there was a big case. I can't remember the actor, but there was a high profile actor uh, that was working on his updating his will. And he wanted to give his one of his children his iTunes library and Apple and somehow it pinged to Apple and they figured out, oh, you can't do that. Those songs are non-transferable. So in that case, the way that the law would work was, you know, when that person passed away, that those files just revert back to Apple. Yeah, well, so with, with unlike it, your dad handing down at some point his vinyl record collection to you. Right, you know? right, exactly. And so with NFTs, you can turn around and resell it. So where I see this going, and I've seen a couple of products already starting to get there, but again, they're very early. Nothing's fully built out yet. Is you'll have a marketplace similar to the iTunes store where you're going to go and buy the NFTs. And then you're going to have a platform where uh, some kind of a music player that where you connect your wallet, it validates what music NFTs you own. And then it goes from that and goes out through the IPFS to download and stream those songs. So it'll look like Spotify, but the songs that you'll have in your library will be the songs that you own the NFTs for. And I bet I bet it'll even get more involved in that where like there will appear opportunities where it's like, or, you know, you can also have an NFT for that particular streaming thing so that you may right. get, you know, you may not have to buy every record directly. There might be ways to sort of buy right. access to streaming them and stuff like that. But uh, go ahead and continue. I got more thoughts, but go ahead. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so so that's, I think, is is a lot of how it's going to look like. And the great thing about NFTs is, like I said, it's just a wrapper for transactions. So the sky is the limit. Obviously, well, the sky and the limits of the law. <laughs> so like... The edge of the, big, the, the boundaries of the universe. Exactly. So, so like that's a big thing right now. There is a lot of copyright infringement happening in the right, space. Right. And that's a big concern. But uh, something I like to remind people is that's not unique to NFTs. Anytime there's a new format, that same thing happens. When SoundCloud came along, it was a lot of people ripping stuff and uploading songs that they had in there, using it as a like a, a file locker. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, people have, they probably still are in certain parts of the world, you know, selling mm -hmm. pirated CDs and cassettes on the side of the street, you know, that stuff exactly. just exists. Exactly. So anytime that there's media and media that people want to consume, there's going to be some copyright infringement. And so the important thing to remember there is that copyright law still exists. Don't go trying to upload and mint somebody else's song, which I don't, Liz, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, very recently there was an issue with a new music NFT platform that, that was basically just scraping the Spotify API. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. And and it was generating new NFTs for everything that was on Spotify. None of the artists had heard a word about about it. None of the labels had heard about it. I I dug pretty deep into it. I managed to get in and and poke around on the platform before it got taken offline. I think it. I don't know that any money actually changed hands. I think it was more than anything an elaborate PR stunt. Right. Uh, but time will tell. Hopefully, by the time this episode comes out, we'll have gotten a lot more information on that whole situation. I'm going to add I'm, to that and I'm going to say that the entire history of cryptocurrencies and blockchains is built on problems like that happening, security mm -hmm. things being pushed, boundaries being pushed so that new developments, you know, new ways of addressing those can come along and it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So that's that's a good way to look at it too. Right. Oh, totally. Um, I've got an idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think about the NFT too, and I think about, um, you know, the power of networking, the power of people spreading the word about things. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anybody's talked about this, but, you know, there's, there's kind of like the, um, right now, I think we first think about the NFT as like, you're the artist, you make it, you sell the one to somebody, it's got an MP3 in it or something. And then if they want to, they can sell it to somebody else. Um, and maybe I'm maybe I don't even need to ask this question, but would it even make sense um, for a market to be like like you want people to buy it, get their portion, maybe download their copy of the record and have that access to that player, and you want people to sell it right away? In other words, like 
have your fan base do all your marketing for you because they're all like, hey, man, you want my NFT? I'll sell it to you for this or whatever. Um, right. It could be really interesting. I mean, I, I bet there are ways to do that. Uh, oh, without absolutely. It, you know, feeling like absolutely. some kind of Ponzi scheme or whatever that is. <laughs> but I don't even right. think that that term applies to any of this. Right. Well, and we're already starting to see some of that. Like uh, Gary Vaynerchuk has his book games NFTs and them and a couple other uh, drops that I've seen. You mentioned the game theory earlier. Right. So par part of the strategy in some of these drops is you'll have uh, they structure them almost more like trading cards. So you'll have different levels of rarity. Uh, so you'll have like your common cards that there's a bunch of, and then you'll have your rares that there may only be a hundred of, and then your super rares that there's maybe one of, or maybe five of out of a big, huge, several thousand drop. So they structure, they structure these in a way so that people get say a common or get two or three common NFTs, and then they can turn around and sell those to work their way up to get to that rare or that super rare that comes with, say, the VIP access perk or uh, the the Skype or the Zoom call, which I've seen a bunch of a uh, bunch of artists include with their super rares is like a one on one 30 minute video call. Nice. And so there's that that gamification of, OK, I didn't get the ones that I wanted, but I can flip these up to get the the level of token that was what I really wanted to get. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um and it brings to mind too the difference between an NFT representing a, uh, a a digital delivery of something that doesn't require another person to back it up necessarily, right. versus an NFT representing access to a human being or a physical location or something where you're counting on. There's still a trust mechanism built in there where you count on that thing to be there when you get there. You know. You count right. on that band to honor your Zoom call or whatever. So those are just two things, two, two ways to think about it. Um, right. But pretty cool stuff. So so it's interesting to hear you talk about the streaming because that was my first thought about this was like, okay, I can see where, uh, you know, if if a market comes up around these where the ability, because the first question is too, is like, okay, so I bought an NFT. Now what do I do with it? How do I even look <laughs> right. at it, listen to it? You know, you bought a funny looking ape or something, but let's stick to music. You bought some music. How do you admire, how do you listen to it or look at it or consume it? Right. And right now that's that's the thing. The the user experience is kind of all over the place. And again, that just has everything to do with how early we are with music NFTs. Mm -hmm. uh, on some platforms, it's you go to the platform and you stream it from the embed on the website. Uh, you can always go through in the contract. So the NFT is, is that token is rep a representation of what's called a smart contract, which is basically just automated code that controls the, the transaction. Um, so it'll point to wherever the media is, is being stored. So you can go through and download the original files right there. Again, I think once everything reaches maturity, you know, could be by the end of this summer, could be, by this time next year, I'm not entirely sure when it'll happen, but I think there's going to be a platform that streamlines and automates all of this. There's so much money and attention being spent trying to figure these things out right now. Mm -hmm. but like I said, it's it's very much like we're at the Netscape phase. You know, we don't even have Windows Media Player just yet, so we're right, we're right, getting, we're getting there. So, so maybe an artist can release a, a folder of songs that's an album. Right. And when the NFT sells to somebody, that person now, because they have this private key and they can go in, unlock it, download all the songs to listen to it later, maybe they're downloading it to a really great NFT player app, which lives on your phone and you've got all those songs there. Maybe that person can then go sell the NFT, put it back on the market and sell it to somebody else who buys right. it and then can also go download those songs. So maybe you're able to sell, you know, the same record multiple times to people and maybe people get to keep the record for the first time. That's an interesting right. idea, right? Right. And and the great thing about, so this was something, you know, way back in the day when I was in school, 2009-ish, I got some pushback from some record label execs. I, I had the idea early on of when 
as CDs were going away, it was, why are we not using custom branded USB flash drives as the new physical format? Mm -hmm. It seemed so obvious, you know, this was in that, in that weird gap period between CDs and Spotify coming around. It made so much sense, but a couple of uh, label execs had the pushback of, well, you would have to lock all the files and you can't use it. And it's like, no, don't, don't you get it? Like the whole point is, a college student is going around to class every day using a thumb drive with the logo of their favorite artist on it. And that brings up conversation and, Oh, Hey, what's, Oh yeah, here, check out this record. And you plug it into your friend's computer and they get to hear the record. But they were so concerned about the DRM and locking down all the files yeah. and all oh, we can't miss out on revenue. So focused but, on policing it. Exactly. But with the NFTs, because of that embedded royalty in the NFT smart contract, it doesn't matter if you sell if you sell the NFT to your friend, the artist still made that money off of that sale. Yeah. So and if people just if if you then well two things. One is if you just try to give the the record to your friend, people have been doing that kind of thing since cassettes right. were around anyway. So this you're not really going to stop that. People will always figure a workaround if they really want to. The question is, is the workaround harder than play, you know, participating in doing right. it the, the normal right way? Um, but you know, the idea of like then saying, like, yeah, I want it here, you can have mine. You can buy it for a little or a lot or whatever. Um, you know, maybe you bought a record for 10 bucks and maybe you sell it to your friend for one dollar. Um right. I, I, you know, I'm just thinking like, does that model work? I mean, it's still that person who wanted to buy it for a dollar, didn't want to buy it for 10 and friends are still going to, you know, hook another friend up or whatever. So that world right. uh, world already existed. In fact, the UCD might've already sold for just a dollar later on. And right. yet now the, the artist and creator will participate in that resale later. Exactly. And maybe even that $1, you know, NFT down the road, is held onto and then becomes really valuable and be and becomes worth 30 later on. And then it gets sold again, you know, so that it's pretty fascinating. Yeah. It's pretty incredible. And, and I know we've spent a lot of time talking about, you know, music as like music delivery, uh, for a fan consumption. Uh, so being a fan, how do you interact with NFTs? But there's some really interesting, uh, things on the horizon for, on the music industry back end for recording studios, music publishing, uh, there's some really cool use cases uh, that are starting to crop up. Things like uh, like sample packs. I've seen a couple. Uh, what's his name? Blau and I think Elenium both have released sample packs as NFTs. So when you purchase the NFT, that's how you get access to the sample library, and it you get all the commercial rights embedded within the NFT transaction. And so you can use that to package. Producers can use it to package their sample libraries and loops. And because of the way that the metadata works, it also can potentially solve a lot of of issues keeping track of split sheets and things like yeah, that. Yeah. There, there are ways. Again, we're still very early. A lot of the technology is yet to be built out fully to be practical for those applications. But that's kind of where we're headed. And then well, like on the on the publishing side of things... Uh, there, I've seen a lot of talk about how right now, when you go to sign a publishing deal, you have your Schedule A, which is all of the songs in your catalog that you're signing to the deal. And right now, it's you know you have to submit a Dropbox or a, a cloud folder with all your MP3s, all your demos and work tapes, and then a spreadsheet with all the songs. And one of the, and this was one of the very first use cases that I heard talked about. Uh, gosh, a year and a half ago at this point was what if instead of having to go through all of that with the database and the spreadsheet, instead of all of that, you just mint your Schedule A to an NFT. So all of the songs are logged there and that NFT have unique identifiers associated with that NFT. And then you license that to the publishing company. And that's what all of the song licensing uh, is done. All, all on the blockchain, publicly verifiable. One of the, To me, one of the most exciting parts about that once we get there is... With NFTs and with crypto transactions, the transactions are immediate. So there's right. no more, you know, anybody that's been around the music industry long enough, you know, that we all know it takes 
Not on a good days. day. Yeah. <laughs> on a good day, it may, you know, the contract may say net 90 and then there's another quarter or two of accounting periods that's gone with crypto and NFTs because all the transactions are immediate. Yeah. You get paid immediately and it's all publicly verifiable. So if there's a question instead of, you know, gosh, I don't even know <laughs> if you had a dispute, you, you got to track down the right person in the accounts department at the label and hope that they can find the invoice and hope that they can figure it. Whereas if it's on the blockchain, anybody can pull up the, uh, the Explorer, find the transaction, look at it, say, okay, here's what happened. Here's what should have happened. And yeah. so the level of transparency, which I think is also exactly why we're going to see some pushback from the traditional music industry because of the transparency. Um, that yeah. typically, typically there, there's been a certain level of, you know, it's been in the label's favor for business transactions to be a little bit more on the opaque side. Um, but I think moving forward, obviously, you know, there's a culture of transparency and the more that we can understand and see the transactions and figure out what's going on, that's how we get people paid in a much more fair, equitable manner, which I think is really, at the end of the day, all the techno technological capabilities are super cool. But what I'm most excited about, about Web3 and NFTs and music is, is taking the control and the ownership and putting it back in the creator's hands. So you don't have to sell, you don't have to give up 85% of your ownership anymore to be able to, you know, pay your bills with your music. Yes, I agree with you. And I think that's cool. Uh, you know, some of the thoughts that pop to mind for me are actually uh, being able to maybe not need the same traditional middleman uh, for, right. for getting music out. So imagine a world where, you know, you make music on your own and you start a channel and you start putting your stuff out. Um, you're making content, making music, you're making videos, uh, whatever it is, you're teaching stuff and you create something and it goes out and it's like a you know, it's like song name dot NFT or something like that. It's like that's instead of a dot MP3, it's got like a, right. a, an appendix that talks about what kind of thing it is. And then when somebody downloads that and then they, you know, sample and remix parts and bits and pieces of it in new software, a DAW, I'm getting way advanced here, but, <laughs> um, you know, that, that metadata is automatically integrated throughout the whole creation process and spit right. out on the other end. Imagine somebody makes a video and they use your music and because they use your music, they didn't even have to think about it. It just automatically reflected back on the blockchain, the fact that your music was used in the video and now it's connected, you know, right. cri cryptographically exactly. to the, to the, um, I don't ask me how it's going to work, but um, <laughs> right. I like the idea of just creating and thinking like, just do your thing, you know, blockchain's got right. your back, you know, that's kind of a cool thought. Right. And again, you know, the constant reminder of how early we are with everything, like right now, something like that couldn't practically work because of the the gas, which is like the transaction fees. But as we start seeing more and more uh, what's called layer two solutions and layer three solutions, which are kind of built on top of each other. So that way, if you think about it in terms of like batching transactions, instead of each individual transaction on layer one, which would be Ethereum, which has the gas fees, which are the like the transaction fees basically that they pay to the computers that validate all the transactions. Instead of doing that for every transaction, which can get expensive quick, layer two bundles, say, an entire day's worth of transactions and logs all of those onto the layer one all at once. So it becomes a lot cheaper to do transactions. So once we have that, you know, maybe a year from now, maybe two years, five years from now, it'll be a lot more feasible. And basically like what you described there, Lige, being able to track all of that metadata through the production process and have it, when it goes to release, all the metadata is already there. The technology has the potential to basically solve the, the what is it, the black box budget issue that the MLC was created for the uh, mechanical licensing uh, was it mechanical licensing mm -hmm. committee you mean um, for, for like uh, mechanicals in terms of record sales? Yeah. Well, so it's the new collection agency that was formed as part of the music modernization act to track down the, all of the publishing royalties that are sitting there that the royalties have been collected, but they don't have the accurate and up-to-date metadata for who those royalties are paid out to. 
because right now it's it was what Harry Fox that kept track of all of the songwriting and publishing metadata. Mm-hmm. And so if they don't know, if they don't have the information for who needs to get paid, the money just sits there in, in the black box account. So that process, Lidge, like you described there, where every step of the way from the, the co-write into the pr- uh, the production session, all the way up through mastering, if the metadata can be logged as it goes on the blockchain, then we're never going to have these black budget bog or black box budgets. Black box budgets. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, exactly. that's hard to say, hard to say, <laughs> say that 10 times fast. Um, the, the blockchain technology and NFT technology can eliminate any of those issues of unpaid royalties because it's all done immediately at the point of transaction. Yeah, that's cool stuff. Have you ever wished you could remove the click track bleed from a singer's vocal mic, the sound of shuffling feet from a full choir, or clicking noises from the valves of an otherwise brilliant trumpet solo? These are just some of the incredible things I have been able to clean up, edit, or remove from a recording using the magic of Isotope RX. Great for mixing with a collection of plugins for your DAW to manage plosives, clicks, S's, noise, buzz, reverb, breaths, and even guitar fret squeaks with the set it and forget it simplicity that lets you focus on your creativity in this studio while you let isotope handle the audio challenges you can even adjust your vocal bass and drum levels inside of a finished stereo mix using the wizardry of rebalance rx is truly magical Try out the subscription option with an extended 30-day free trial at isotope.com slash rockstars or use the coupon code ROCK10 to get 10% off any individual plug-in purchase. OWC now brings you the Mini Stack STX, the world's first Thunderbolt 4 certified storage and hub expander. Perfectly sized to stack with the Mac Mini and the ideal storage and connectivity companion for Thunderbolt or USB equipped computers and devices. With a universal SATA HDD SSD Bay and NVMe M.2 PCIe SSD slot, you can expand your Mini's storage capacity to gigantic proportions. Three Thunderbolt USB-C ports enable you to connect to millions of Thunderbolt, USB, and future USB 4 drives, displays, AV mixers, cameras, and tablets, as well as desktop accessories like a keyboard, card reader, or mouse. I'm using the Mini Stack STX paired with my Mac Mini M1 to house my dedicated audio SSD and sample libraries, and it works great in my studio. Find the new Mini Stack STX and all your storage needs at maxsales.com slash rockstars. I want to uh, include a question. I actually got a question. I was, I was chatting with my girlfriend and she's also very fascinated by this stuff. And, and so I said, like, what would you like to know? And so she had a couple of questions I thought I'd ask you too. This yeah. one was interesting. Um, Chrissy says, how do NFTs relate to a true love of music and how does that differ from any other art form? Does it change the purity of music by becoming a status symbol? Why would people want an NFT? Why does somebody want a test pressing of Sgt. Pepper's? Right right now, I think it's kind of that same thing. It's collectibles. It's being able to, to say, hey, like I have this. So yes, there is some of the status symbol aspect of it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, part of that is with it being so early, it's kind of that first mover advantage. Uh, and it's going to be the same thing with a lot of the, the one of ones that we're seeing the very high value, crazy expensive one of one NFTs. It's going to be, I think, looked at not as diluting the quality of the music or the value of the music, but it's just going to be an additional thing. The same way that people already collect memorabilia. Uh, a great example, uh, I saw somebody on Twitter make this comment. It's kind of like with buying cars. If you buy just a Porsche off the lot, it's going to be, you know, not cheap, but it's going to be worth a Porsche money. But if you bought a Porsche from Jerry Seinfeld, because you bought it from Jerry Seinfeld, that Porsche is going to be worth a lot more money. Right, totally. Um, and, or if you just bought it used on Craigslist, it's going to be a lot less money. Exactly. And so I, I think it, if anything, it's bringing a lot more value back because we've kind of in the web two streaming era, 
this is partially my personal thoughts and feelings a little bit based off of some market analysis, like the community aspect of music has kind of gone away with the streaming era because we used to have, you know, when you pulled with vinyl or CDs, you'd pull the record down. You'd have to have this physical interaction with the record, open it up. You've got the lyrics, you've got all this gorgeous artwork right there. And listening to music was an experience and you had your friends at the record shop or at school or at work that you would talk about records and you had that community aspect and that all kind of went away with streaming to an extent where it's, you know, you've got an endless stream of all the music ever right at your fingertips. And not only is it there, they don't include, you know, all the, the digital art booklets only just recently in the United States have we gotten lyrics back on Spotify. Credits are a hot mess. Like even when you do report out credits through your distributor, half the time they don't show up on Spotify, so you can't even see who worked on it. So mm -hmm. we've lost a lot of that aspect of being a music fan and engaging with music. And I, and I think NFTs, and when they're done right, are really bringing a lot of that experience back to engaging with music because there's a lot more ways now to engage with NFTs. There are, there are ways, and I'm sure we still haven't even seen some of the coolest applications because they haven't been thought of yet. We're going to see people use NFTs to engage with their fan communities on a level that before, before now has been unheard of. Well, what, you know, when I think of streaming too, one of the things that's exciting to me um, is the way it is now. It's like, you feel like you've got, a handful of major streaming site options where you go and you have access to everything. And we know from, you know, uh, the paralysis of choice, having mm -hmm. access to everything doesn't really give you access to anything. You know, you, it ends up being a combination of like, well, you know, maybe they've got some playlists that they recommended that, that we can narrow this down to something good. More often than not, the first thing you're confronted with is suggestions of a whole ton of noise where you're just like, God, right. I have no interest in any of this stuff. I can't even, I can't even think straight. I'm just being presented with so much stuff I'm not interested in. Right. And then, and then, you know, then it's like, okay, and then you pause and like, you're thinking about like, well, what do I want to go listen to, you know? So there's that whole challenge of curation, right? But we live in a world where there's, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of one, two, three, you know, four, five places I could go listen to music. And then on the other end of it is, you know, you've got like your your band camp and things like that, which are setting themselves up apart as a place where the artist gets paid better and you can go listen to some stuff there. And immediately, like when I was looking at that, it was like, oh, this music, this is also kind of different. You know, it feels more indie. It feels more like I went right. to a cool record store or a club. And what I see is possible with NFTs is the it's like the the buy back end and the finance can be taken care of such that somebody could hopefully come along and just like starting your own record store or your own club and your own thing that's a certain genre of music you're interested in, you could go and start populating it and make it a central hub for what you're right. interested in. And maybe, you know, maybe, and then, and then it all works financially on the back end without it having to get too complicated and without having to call up your lawyers. Sorry, sorry, lawyer <laughs> right. friends. But, you know, that kind of stuff's exciting to me. I don't know exactly how it's going to take shape, but I like the idea of just going and hanging out in what feels like a record store environment and discovering right. new independent artists and stuff because it's all taken care of. Oh, well, and you know, Lidge, before long, you'll be putting on your VR headset to go into the metaverse to go to see your favorite band play an in-store at the, at the virtual record store where you can buy the NFT and it's all going to be happening in VR, which is an interesting, uh, interesting tie-in here with Dolby Atmos and spatial audio, which I know has been a, a hot topic. Mm -hmm. Some people love it. Some, a lot of people hate it. But I, for years, you know, I, I love any cool surround format. Like I loved SACD, DVD audio, but from a commercial standpoint, it wasn't practical. We'd right. spend all this money, you know, in the studio making these gorgeous, elaborate mixes. But also, to be honest, the only place I've listened to any of those mixes is at Studio C and Blackbird. So like, <laughs> as much of a fan yeah. as I am, yeah. like, that's also like, if you're going to listen to them, that's where you listen to them. But also, like, I haven't had the playback system even to listen outside of that. 
so it was always hard for me to see the commercial application of things like Dolby Atmos. But now that all of this metaverse stuff is starting to develop, that's really where it's going to come into play where you go to these concerts in the metaverse and whether it's the Oculus or the Sony VR system, whatever VR system you're using. Let's, a let's lot choose of, one that doesn't exist yet because that's coming. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so what you're going to see is, you know, some kind of tracking sensor on the headband of the VR so that when you turn your head to the left and look left, the sound, the sound stage and the stereo field is going to rotate with that. And you're going to see more and we're already seeing more and more metaverse music performances. So I think what we're going to see is to an extent, but less of like a record mixed for Atmos and that being the deliverable for the metaverse as much as it's going to be live performances that are going to be streamed in Atmos in real time. I'm not sure what the tech back end looks like on that. I'm sure it's crazy heavy computing power uh, in order to live stream Atmos audio. Um, but that's where it's, I think where it's really headed and, and we're going to see a lot more spatial audio happening in these metaverse performances. Yeah. Well, it's fascinating stuff. Um, I've had some experience in uh, Oculus and I, and it's fun and I dig it. Uh, but I also know that I can't move around or else I'll get dizzy. <laughs> so I'm in right. that category. Right. But again, don't get hung up on the details of the tech. Um, that doesn't mean that some other version of of immersive experience can't come along and be just fine, you know. Right. Um, and it, it it's cool stuff. So uh, let me let me continue with a couple of other questions about this stuff too. So so another one that came in um, also from Chrissy said, uh, "What have been some of the most successful NFTs that you've seen so far?" And you started to mention it, so maybe we don't have to go back there. But if there's anything else that's fun to discuss, you can bring yeah. That up. Oh. Definitely. Um, so obviously, like across all of NFTs right now, the big ones are a lot of these uh, profile picture series where they're uh, they're generative images uh, where they've got like a, a body and hats and different color schemes that there will be. So there will be like 10,000 of the images that are all generated with different features and different levels of rarity. So a few of those are like CryptoPunks and Board Ape Yacht Club, which those are some of the very first ones. So those are getting a lot of attention. Uh, like the Board Ape Yacht Club, Justin Bieber just bought one uh, a week or two ago for at the time of recording for just over a million dollars. Wow. On the yeah, so it's it's incredible. On the music side, Blau, definitely a status uh, symbol thing. Oh yeah, very much so. It's. I've seen people make the analogy of it's kind of like the digital version of getting a Birkin bag, which for those of you not familiar, that's a super high end uh, handbag where you kind of you have like you can't just go buy a Birkin bag. You have to go to the right store and they have to have one in stock and they have to like approve you that you're worthy of yeah, owning I've, a fifteen twenty thousand dollar bag. Yeah, I got three or four of them, man. Right. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you're right. Uh, but on the music side, uh, Blau is probably one of the leaders right now. He's done a, a series of different uh, drops for his own music. Um, Steve Aoki has, has been doing a lot. Um, Blau also has a, an interesting platform called Royal, where they're tokenizing digital streaming royalties. So basically, uh, so they did a big release with Nas. Uh, that was the, their first big drop where if you buy the NFT of that song, you get a portion of the streaming royalties from that song. Mm. I have a lot of mi I have a lot of mixed feelings on that. Um, and now, my feelings aside, it sold out. They sold out all the tokens within like under 30 minutes. They made a ton of money on the front end. My concern is, you know, part of this whole conversation of why are we so into NFTs? Why are they so good for music is bringing the value back. I mean, you can't almost can't get on social media these days without seeing somebody talking about how little streaming pays out, you know, right. average what right. four, four tenths of a cent per stream. So kind of my gut response is, okay, so if the streaming royalties are that bad, why are we trying to bring those into the new thing that's trying to fix that? Right, right. Well, there's always that, hybrid approach to right. let's, let's see if we can keep alive the old way and integrate the new way. And that'll sort itself out. 
Um, right. But but my takeaway from that again is the is the idea that I love, which is you know your 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 street army for whatever it is that you're creating. If you're a right. band, you know, and you've got an ar- army of fans that love your stuff, if they feel incentivized to want to tell people about it and share it, that can be a good thing. Uh, obviously. It right. can it can hit a threshold too. Sometimes I joke about Nashville as a place where you go and you're like you meet somebody on the street and you're like, "Hey man, check it out, man! I just finished my new CD. Here it is." And they're like, "Oh yeah, I just finished my new CD." Here it is. <laughs> right. you, know? you know, when you hit that threshold, it's like everybody's trying to get you excited about something else. But that also kind of works, you know, because we got a lot of room right. for enjoying all sorts of things out there. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, um, I, I, th- I think I love just the amount of experimentation right now, like whether I think it's a good idea or it's going to work out or not, like the fact that NFTs are bringing the the capability for everybody to just try stuff out and see what works. I think that's really exciting. Yeah. All right. Well, so where should somebody begin if they're curious about NFTs? Um, I, I wrote a question here just saying like, what's the connection between NFTs and cryptocurrency? So if that's part of the answer, uh, we can, we can include that, but give somebody a, basic introduction to if you're interested right now here's you know some of the steps you would need to take in order to go get yourself an nft and and experience it right so um so again there definitely is some learning curve right now uh but as things develop it's going to get easier and easier to use so right now you have to have ethereum most and again this is where there's caveat of like there's so much information all of the major action is happening on Ethereum, uh, mm-hmm. which is both a blockchain and a currency. Uh, so Ethereum is the native token, the native currency token of the Ethereum network. That's where all the big NFTs are happening. But there are also others like Polygon, which is built on top of Ethereum, but it's separate. And so it's a lot cheaper to do transactions. So when you're learning, I definitely would recommend looking at Polygon or even Avalanche, which is another blockchain network, um, somewhere that you can experiment and kind of get your feet wet without having to worry about, you know, paying $50 in the gas transaction fee to buy a $10 NFT. Don't do that on Ethereum. Go over to Polygon or one of the other networks where it's the transactions are not as expensive. So but basically, so that, you, you need to start by having some form of cryptocurrency, right. which you can then use to spend to buy an NFT. So you need to right, go exactly. from your dollars in your bank account to something, and then you use that something to buy the NFT. Right. And so right now, uh, the big platforms are like Coinbase, FTX, US, um, Crypto.com. I believe, I'm pretty sure Crypto.com lets you transfer out. And so you go to these, what are called exchanges, where you sign up, create an account, And that's where you can connect it to your bank account, your credit or debit card, and you can fund the account and purchase your cryptocurrencies. And then you have to I'll add to that. I'll say, Rockstars, it's just like getting a PayPal account or something. Yeah, exactly. Same same thing. Getting your Venmo started or whatever. No no more complicated than that, really. Exactly. Um, And then from there, uh, you create your wallet, which MetaMask is probably the most popular right now. And there's others and there's... And you can get granular. There are things like hardware wallets, like ledgers. And what that is, is it serves the same function as like a MetaMask, which MetaMask uh, runs as a browser extension. But a hardware wallet gives you an extra layer of security. So that way it's in a physical little USB device. Yeah, that's that's and getting that, pretty deep for maybe with the yeah, Rockstars, but it, it's yes. Getting pretty deep. And that's where like when you've got a lot of value um, and you know, you've got a board ape, you you don't want to keep a board ape in your MetaMask on your browser. Let's think about it this way. That. Yeah, let's think about it this way. Rockstars, if you went out and you could go buy a vintage Strat now for a hundred bucks, you'd probably just carry the hundred dollars in your pocket and it'd be no big deal. But if, you know, a month from now you realize, oh my God, this guitar is worth a hundred thousand dollars, you'd probably put it in a special secure safe or something like that. And that's what, mm-hmm. that's what the hardware wallet is. So but exactly. you, we don't need that stuff to get started. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's in me, the is MetaMask something you can just download from to your phone, for example? Yeah, they've got a, a phone app, uh, and it's out there as a Chrome extension. Um, I use it with Brave browser as well, and you just log in from there. And then when you pull up a Web three, what's called a D app, a decentralized app, that's just the fancy 
fancy nomenclature that they use uh, for the web apps. And you'll sign in and connect with your wallet and you just approve all the transactions within the wallet extension. And it's really as easy as that. You go to a website, say, I want this NFT, click approve transaction. It'll pop up a little notification saying, do you want to accept this? And it'll give you the details of the transaction, tell you how much the gas is going to cost. And you can click accept or reject, click accept, and then wait a few seconds for the transaction to process. And bam, you've got an NFT. Okay. And when you've, quote, got an NFT, what does that look like? Does that mean you have this MetaMask wallet is holding some additional code lines, you know, keys or something like that? Or right. do you take the NFT and put it on something? So it you have that token, which the NFT itself, um, and this is where it gets a little bit more granular and techy. So in, in, a, in a sense, the NFT kind of serves like the receipt. It's more the transaction record. Mm-hmm. And so that's stored... But but it's it's also the equivalent of like the proof of ownership. So it's kind of if you think of it as like a deed to a house, you know, if you have that physical deed, that piece of paper is not the house, but that piece of paper is how you establish ownership of the house. Now, should we expect like we just did this thing? Do we go check our email and there it is in the email, or is that the wrong way to think of this stuff? Uh, yeah, so it's not even in the email. It's all all everything takes place in the wallet. Okay, cool. <laughs> Do you feel like the time you've spent watching YouTube videos, trying out mix tricks, and tweaking version after version of your mixes has not gotten you anywhere? Have you been looking for a simple or straightforward step-by-step process for creating a pro mix that won't take years to learn? What if you could learn that process from a Grammy-winning mix engineer who understood all your mixing struggles and could coach you through them? If you struggle with any of these questions, then the Ultimate Mixing Masterclass is for you. Now you can discover a proven step-by-step mix system from Grammy-winning mixer Craig Alvin for consistently creating a pro-quality mix from your home studio that will sound amazing everywhere. Here's a quote from one of the students. Absolutely the most informative and helpful block of information mentoring on the mix process I've ever been a part of. This was like sitting behind a mix engineer for years, watching and picking up tips along the way, condensed into a six to seven hour session. Look, when you're ready to take your mixes to Grammy-winning quality, then go to Ultimate Mixing masterclass.com and go check out Craig's ultimate snare mixing trick now for free. So then when you have this wallet receipt, then you can go whatever whatever the form is today for going and listening to the MP3 or viewing it or displaying it and whatever it is in the future, whether it's like access to a streaming site or whether it's even whether that NFT maybe was the VIP pass to go to um, go up and meet the band at the next show at the arena or something like that. Right. Right. Then that, then you just use those keys to unlock whatever it is. Right. Okay, cool, man. Exactly. Um, What else? uh, Well, here's one, one last question I thought I'd ask and then, then we should wrap up. But um, have you, are you familiar with any, uh, and I, I we kind of answered this because we talked about the VIP or the Zoom call, but w- what is, what have you heard about the world of physical NFTs and what does that even mean? Um, a lot. So actually the first NFT that I ever bought actually was for a physical item. Um, there's a, a an NFT platform called Foundation that's very geared towards art. Like you think New York City art galleries, it's that kind of stuff. And so there's a process where you can do what's called burning an NFT, where you basically through you basically delete the code and you destroy the NFT in exchange for redeeming it for something else. So in this case, I bought the NFT of uh, a an image by the artist Signe Pierce, uh, who I've been following for years and absolutely love. And then I redeemed it. I burnt the NFT in exchange for a signed physical print of the art. Okay, cool. So in this case, the NFT doesn't go on to live a long life. It just makes the right purchase. Right. And and again, that's another cool thing. There's so many different ways that you can figure can configure it. I'm also seeing artists where if you hold a certain level of the of NFT 
every quarter, or every year, whenever there's new merch, you automatically get that merch and you don't have to burn the NFT. So you still have the NFT and you can keep redeeming it over and over. So there's, it's one of those things where there's a bunch of different ways that you can approach it. And I think ultimately there's not going to be a right or wrong way to approach that, that side of physical NFTs. Uh, it's just more what works for your brand, what works for your specific business. If you want to have them burn the NFT to get a t-shirt or an access perk, or if you want to just have them redeem it and keep the NFT as memorabilia, I think all of those options work. It just comes down to what makes the most sense for your brand and your audience. Yeah, that's cool. All right. Um, there is one thing I was going to add on to the NFTs and cryptocurrency answer. You know, I looked, I did a Google search and there are uh, at least found one company that um, I think it was called MoonPay. I don't know anything about it. So I don't want to, mm, you know, mm -hmm. shill it or something like that. But um, they said, you know, they, that they're, there are maybe some things popping up where you can just, oh, I can just go use a credit card and through this particular website or app, um, do an NFT checkout. So they're probably, that makes sense that there would be right. people who are like, yeah, sure, just link up your PayPal and you can go buy an NFT. So, right. um, so that stuff should be out there too. And then just as a, a closing thought before I give you my very last question, um, if a, one of the rock stars wants to go explore making an NFT right now, if I wanted to, um, where would you point somebody to to go release their first song or single or record as an NFT? Uh, well, so this is going to be an interesting answer because right now, day of taping versus when the episode comes out could be two completely different answers. Okay. Um, but as of right now, uh, there some of the big platforms uh, like we've talked about are going to be sound.xyz. And these are specific for music, by the way. So sound catalog uh, dot works uh there's a dow called moda dow m-o-d-a that they're not a platform yet but they're kind of a collective that they're working on a bunch of different platforms um open c is pretty popular there's a lot of there's a lot going on with open c right now so it's one of those kind of we'll wait and see uh, but it is probably the most popular secondary market right now you'd have to get past some apes and monkeys to get to the music part right yeah, the audio NFTs are not they they are on OpenSea, but it's yeah like several lev levels down as far as like what's trending and what's popular on the platform. Yeah, yeah. And and uh, if you want to create uh, a great resource to create your own smart contracts is Manifold. It's Manifold. I believe it's Manifold.xyz. We might have to double check and make sure that that's the correct address. Um, but Manifold is a system where they give you the framework to make your own NFTs and smart contracts where you completely own the smart contract. And right now, that's I haven't directly used them, but I've been following them for a while. I know a lot of people that are using Manifold. And that definitely seems to be the way to go if you're not working with another NFT company uh, that is writing the smart contracts for you. If you want to do it yourself, Manifold definitely seems to be the way to go. And if you wanted to create an NFT that was, you know, a five-way split with the five members of the band, is that easy to do at this point? Or is that still, is that hard to do and it's easier to just do a single? Um, yeah, it, it's it, it's doable, but it takes some doing. Uh, you kind of got to know it'll what come you're doing. Later, right? Yeah, it, it's... Right now, it's one of those things where there's, again, there are several mechanisms. There's what's called multi-signature wallets, where it's kind of like a shared, think of it like a shared bank account where mm -hmm. multiple people have to have to sign the transaction before it goes through. So like all five um, members of the band would have to release right. the funds to buy the bread and the bologna for making sandwiches on the road. Right, exactly. And so there's that and there's other wallets that serve as like pass-through wallets. So say the royalty from the original NFT goes to this pass-through wallet, which then splits it up to the five beneficiaries. So there's ways to do it. It's not the simplest way to do it right now to split it at point of transaction, but it is doable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, I apologize. I apologize, Rockstars. I'm, I forgot for a moment I'm vegan, so I wouldn't be buying bologna. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> vegan, uh, vegan bologna, impossible bologna. There you go. All right. Um, okay, cool. Well, do you see that though as being something that will, should happen and is important to people is to be able to just share in revenue like that? 
Oh, absolutely. And and I think whether it's bet- whether it's a DAO or a multi-signature wallet or whatever it looks like, it's definitely on its way. And I think it's going to be great for everything from splitting revenues from song splits to uh, maybe forming a DAO or something that looks similar to that uh, for a band agreement and a band bank account. I, like I said earlier in the conversation, it's kind of if you think about we're just upgrading the bank accounts, up, upgrading the cash registers. Mm-hmm. So a lot of it will look like what we've known in the past, just digital. Right. And hopefully a little bit s- smoother and easier. Yeah. A lot smoother, a lot easier, a lot faster too. Hopefully at the end of the night, somebody, the biggest, tallest, meanest looking dude in the band doesn't have to go corner the club owner to try and get the payment right. after the show. Right, exactly. Uh, I don't want to pick on anybody. Um, but uh, that's certainly been a story in the past, right? Right. Well, cool, man. Well, Ethan, uh, thanks so much for being on the show with us. It's been a total blast to hang out with you, man. I love this stuff. And, and thank you. Rockstars, if you're still here now, then obviously you're interested in this stuff yeah. too because people who aren't will have already switched on to a different episode. But um, let me ask you this one little closing question I like to ask all of our guests. We're going to take the yeah. way back studio machine and you get to go back and find young Ethan and say, listen, dude, I've come back to give you this single bit of advice. Here's Maybe it's back when you were you know, mm. loading up Napster tunes or something like that. And you say, Here's the most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. What advice would you like to go back and give yourself? Oh, man, that's a that's a great question. I, I'd say probably one of the biggest things would be don't get quite so caught up in the details. The gear doesn't always matter. The song matters. Nice. I, I, I was one of those. I got struck by gas real bad. Uh, <laughs> the gear, gear acquisition syndrome, yeah, especially yeah. going straight from full sale to Blackbird. Um, you, they got, you they get got a little, some gear there. yeah, you get a little spoiled. And, and that was something that I personally struggled with was getting out of Blackbird and being like, oh, well, I want to do this. Oh, but I don't have any API or I don't have these vintage Neumanns or, and, and that was kind of a mental roadblock that I dealt with for years. And when I was finally able to be like, no, you know what? I could have a stack of 57s and an old, I mentioned earlier, uh, I think off the air, my main inter- interface is still a DigiDesign 003. Ah, uh, yeah, that's right, man. So, awesome. And it it sounds great. It works. It's not going to work forever, but for now it works and it sounds great. So if it works and gets the job done, at the end of the day, getting the job done is way more important than what you use to get the job done. Yeah, that's great. I need to, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to do a session where I just have nothing but a handful of 57s. Oh, yeah. But you can long. make such great... Such great sounds with just 57s. Awesome, dude. Well, thank you for being on Recording Studio Rockstars with us, man. It's really kind of you to join us and just kind of like fill us in on this NFT stuff. I know it's a lot, Rockstars. If you have questions and wherever you're listening to this, you can comment on stuff. Please jump in, uh, make a comment. Um, Sometimes, depending on where you're listening to the episode, you can actually share it from a particular timestamp in there. So if you've got a part where you're like right here, um, you know, I, I got a question about what you said right here. Just grab that time st- stamp and and share it. Um, Ethan, where would you like the rock stars to go find you online if they're ready to either make yeah. the next hit record with you or just, uh, you know, talk to you about all this NFT stuff and maybe they're ready to to launch their record that way. How should people find you? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much again for having me. It's been a blast. Uh, right now, the best way to get in touch with me is honestly probably through Twitter. It's uh, at Ethan X Howard. Uh, and that's my username across all social media. Twitter is where I'm the most active and where I'm the easiest to get in touch with. Uh, but just send me a DM. Um, I've, I'll have uh, a link tree in all my bios so you can get to my full on website, whatever I'm working on at the time. Uh, but Twitter is probably the best place to get in touch with me. Okay, cool. And um, we can't talk about it or or you'd have to kill me and everybody else, but I think you got exciting stuff coming down the pipe. So maybe yeah. <laughs> when the uh, when this episode comes out, that will be, we'll be there already. But these yeah. are exciting times, man, and very cool stuff. Um, and Rockstars, if you can, please come join us in our Facebook group as well. Just look for, uh, in Facebook groups, Recording Studio Rockstars, when you um, sign up to join, make sure you ask the three questions so that we let you in. That's how we keep the spam bots out. 
And um, if you got anything to say about this episode, again, you could share that timestamp linked in there. And um, I'll make sure Ethan's in there with us too. And we can all chat about things. Yeah. Ethan, you rock, dude. Yeah, you rock. All right, man. I'll see you around the studio. And um, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for listening, rock stars. Yeah, thanks for having me. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, then please share this episode with your friends on social media and leave a rating and review on iTunes to help the podcast reach more rock stars like yourself. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to rsrockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And remember to hit the subscribe button to keep up with weekly episodes. And if you're ready to make your best record ever now, then head over to Recording Studio Rockstars Academy, where you can start with my free course at mixmasterbundle.com and if you want more free content from recording studio rockstars all you have to do is go to rsrockstars.com slash email again that's rsrockstars.com slash email to enter your name and email and i'll keep you in the loop with articles videos podcast updates and even free gear giveaways for your studio just look for the link in the show notes below thanks so much for listening and thanks for being a rock star i'm lid shaw and this is recording studio rockstars now go make Make great music. Recording Studio Rockstars would like to give a big thank you to our amazing sponsors who help make this episode possible. API, OWC, Spectra 1964, Sampley, Atom Audio, and Isotope. Remember to use these coupon codes for special discounts. At isotope.com slash rockstars, use the coupon code ROCK10 for 10% off any plug-in purchase or start your extended 30-day free trial subscription for access to many plugins. At sampley.app, sign up for a free account with unlimited projects and use the coupon code RSR20 to get 20% off the first three months when you're ready to upgrade to a pro account. At recordingstudiorockstars.com slash Academy, use the coupon ROCKSTAR for 10% off any course for a limited time. You will find links to all these awesome sponsors in our show notes. These are all things I highly recommend for your studio. They're going to help you make your best record ever. I would also like to thank our fantastic team here at Recording Studio Rockstars, Vlad Wesselchenko, Braden Stremming, and John Richardson for additional podcast and video production. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers.